Hi, this is Brian Keene, host of The Horror Show with Brian Keene here on Project iRadio. As you know, the Project iRadio network is growing in popularity, but with that popularity comes bigger expenses. Uh, now, I suggested that we have a yard sale. I thought maybe we could all go to Armand Rose Amelia's house and open up his garage and sell his furniture, probably without him or his wife knowing, but that idea got vetoed. So what we've done instead is we've started a patron campaign where you can directly support the network. Uh, you can become a patron at patron.com slash Project iRadio. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Project iRadio. Uh, if you'll become a patron, every dollar you pledge comes with exclusive rewards and goes towards helping the network grow. And it also goes towards me not breaking into Armand Rosamilia's house when he's not home and having a yard sale. So please, if you could, take a moment patron.com slash Project iRadio, and thank you in advance for your support. No comment! Sir, what about the ending to The Rising? Mother f <laughs> What part of no comment don't you understand? Do you understand this? This interview is over! No comment! The f Brian Keen was also unavailable for comment. to the horror show i'm dave uh as you may or may not notice brian is not here this week brian is currently on a book tour yay uh, but i have somebody else here with me you may have already heard her yeah, uh, yeah who, who, who's here with me phoebe yeah, that's right phoebe is here with me <laughs> she, and no she's not been drinking no sadly did <laughs> no. have a delicious bloody mary actually we brunch. have been drinking yes we have been drinking because we went to brunch this morning mary took us to brunch she had won a 50 dollar gift card to a local restaurant so we went to brunch this morning and you had a bloody mary bloody mary it's very delicious yeah, and i had an orange crush which was vodka and orange juice and other liqueurs and it was also very tasty it was very tasty yes. and so the meal was awesome the meal so. was the meal was amazing it was actually place, it was a place called mother's mother's restaurant in um, timonium well yeah timonium um there's actually uh there's one downtown in baltimore here check them out good yeah food. no it's really good really good food um i had steak and eggs and it was excellent and i had a like a crab cake eggs benedict yeah. very good no it was, it was really good and yeah so we i guess we technically been drinking but it was you know a long time many ago. hours ago We're at this sober. point yes sadly so. <laughs> it's a work day tomorrow i can't be drinking yeah that's true yeah in a couple weeks though Yes, we yeah. will be. <laughs> we, yeah, we're going to be on a cruise. We're hitting the high seas. Yes, yes we're going to be in the Caribbean, and uh, yes, we have the drink package. Yes, so. we do. Yes, we do. <laughs> we'll be taking advantage of that. So uh, the, the show you're hearing right now is, uh, is being pre-recorded because Brian is on the road this week. Like I said, he's, doing, you know, he's on his uh, book tour for pressure. And also this week is, uh, as we've been talking about on the show, Scares It Cares. Yay! Which, when the show goes live on Thursday... We'll uh, be in the pool. Yeah, we'll be at the pool. Wa yeah, and we'll be in the pool watching Jaws. Yes. Um, the show actually will be. Up, you'll you'll notice this. The show will probably be up. Will be up early. Not probably. It will be because I'm putting it up before we leave on Thursday. So, uh, but yeah, that's why the show's being pre-recorded. Now, this week's show features a two-hour interview wow. with author uh, John Skip and uh, author and filmmaker Laura Lee Barr, and it's a great interview. Brian recorded this when he was in Los Angeles a couple weeks ago. And I think everybody's going to really enjoy this. So you're going to definitely want to listen to that. Um, but yeah, it's, it Scares and Cares this week. Um, I, I'm excited. It's the third one. We've been to, we've been to both previous Scares and Cares. Yeah, it's, it's a really nice event. It's, it's a ton it's of fun. It's really nice what, what for are you everybody. Looking, what are you looking forward to? Um, well, I like to see everybody. I always find out, find some new authors to read or get some books. Um, there's always some interesting guests. I'm more of like a, a television fan girl more so than um Dave probably is <laughs> um so it's always neat to see people that I recognize but 
it's the it's the hotel loves having us there. It's a really nice hotel. They like have special drinks. The staff dress up like in costumes on different at different points. They welcome us in. It's it's a fun event. It's family friendly. There's plenty of little raucous, silly after hours behavior. Lots <laughs> yes. of people being goofballs. Yeah. Um, but it's a great time to catch up with with people and see what else is going on with everybody in the genre and help kids or people in need and that's what's the best part yes absolutely it's a ton of fun mm -hmm. um i we've been talking about you know me and brian have been talking about for months um you know at this point uh as you hear the show the show is about to start uh but you know you still you have time to jump in your car and drive there if you haven't so uh or donate online yeah that's true they do take donations online anyway i hope to see some of you there um Brian will, you know, he's he's on tour right now. I, I believe he's in Florida right now as we record I this. Think so, yeah. I think he's in Florida. Um, he's doing dates, and obviously he's going to be at Scares of Cares along with uh, Mary San Giovanni, Kelly Owen, Bob Ford, uh, Weston Oaks, Yvonne Navarro, Jonathan Jantz, Jonathan Jantz, Joe Christian, Lansdale, yeah. Christian Jensen. You know, tons of people who've been on our show yeah. and who have not been on our show. Mike Lombardo will be there. Yeah, uh, Lombardo, yeah. read your book. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you've heard us talking the show before. That we're supposed to do an episode of the Lombardo and Phoebe book club, and Phoebe has read her book and Lombardo has not. So we're we're hoping that he gets it done. I would honestly love to record the episode of Scares of Cares, but I don't know if that's going to happen. I think Mike's going to be busy. He's going to be very busy. Well, we're all going to be very busy. You know what's stuff. important about Scares of Cares and Lombardo? What's that? Aren't they premiering the first trailer? He is premiering the trailer for too. the new movie. Yes. Uh, I'm um, dreaming of a white doomsday. doomsday. Yes, we're all very excited. Yeah, I've not seen any footage of this. We were at uh, Coop's house because they shot some of this at Coop's house. We were at Coop's house one day when we were filming, so I saw some of the filming. Um, Phoebe did not see it because Phoebe was playing with the dog. I was playing with the dog. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Priorities here. Yeah, but uh, but I've seen that. I've not seen any footage from it yet. I I honestly, you know, I know. I know Brian has seen a rough cut and some other people. I, I'm waiting for the premiere, wherever that may be and yeah. when it may be. But, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing the trailer. So Very excited. Yes. Um, He's so a you, talented guy. Yeah. You definitely want to stop by his booth because you, you can see... You know the trailer, and he's always entertaining. He so is. Yes, yeah, scares scares this week. Like I said, Brian is is on tour. Uh, now next week, at, as as you listen to the show, next week I uh, said to read Brian. There's a couple signings coming up on Thursday, July 28th. He will be at the Mongahelia Arts Center. That's Monongahela. Monongahela. See, I'm already screwing yeah, this up. I lived in Pittsburgh. I okay. have to live there to know how to say it. Okay. Well, see, I never lived there. So yeah. that's in Morgantown, West Virginia, and that'll be from seven to nine p.m. Friday, July 29th, he's going to be at Books a Million. That one you knew. In Be <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Beckley, West Virginia. And that's going to be from 6 to 8 p.m. And then finally, July 30th, he's going to be at Rickert and Beagle Books in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Who do they have dogs there because it says Beagles? I don't know. I doubt uh, it. But probably not. Anyway, so that's in Pittsburgh, and that'll be from uh, 2 to 5 p.m. That's so awesome. If you're in the area and you want to get your book signed... Uh, Definitely check those out, and you know he's doing this tour mainly for his new book Pressure and his new book The Complex. Both and, of which uh, are I've awesome. Read, yes, we both read The Complex. I have not yet read Pressure, but you read Pressure. I did. So I read I it in one give sitting. The audience a quick review of Pressure. I did. It's it's really it's kind of um, it's I'm not good at this. I guess huh? <laughs> I really liked the book. It really. Um, it explores some interesting um, theories on what could happen in the bottom of the ocean if scientists do bad things. Okay. I don't want to give anything no, away. No, don't definitely don't give anything because away. Because it's really good. It's, it's, it's you may never swim in the ocean again. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. Um, that's that's good. You and know. it's really it's really good. It's really yeah. engaging and it's a great read. I read it. I sat down and read the whole thing in one. I was sitting. gonna say you read it one day. Yeah, it was yeah, really good. Sitting here, so. Yeah, uh, two I, thumbs up. Yeah, two. Well, well, there you go. Two thumbs up. You can't get any better recommendation than that. Yeah. Um, we're not going to talk about a lot of stuff today because that interview's so long. It sounds like it's a really good. It's one. really good. If yeah, it's going to run people, that long. People you guys, like it. You know, it's, it's don't one, waste people's again. Time. It's one of the. It's a great interview. Um, but you did want to update people that listen. Oh yeah. About something that that you and I did earlier in the year, so I'll let you tell that story. Well, you all know that I'm a sucker for animals, and earlier. This year, in March, we rescued a mom, a cat, and five kittens. Well, it turns out the five kittens were all girl kittens. 
That's very which, unusual, right? Yeah, I was really surprised. I couldn't understand why I couldn't tell anybody apart. That's why. Because all their butts looked the same because they were all the same. Yeah. So, um, we just heard that the last two of the five kittens have been adopted. Um, and the mama cat is living in a lovely farm somewhere in Southern Maryland. And everybody's doing well. And here's my shameless plug for spay and neuter. A mom cat and her five kittens would have created thousands of unwanted little babies that would live a rough life on the street, generally not surviving very long. So it's really important to just be responsible with your pets, whether dogs, cats, guinea pigs, rabbits, and anything else that um, have them spayed and neutered for their health and for your sanity and for just being responsible because there's enough unwanted animals in the world. So check out your shelters and this whole Pokemon Go thing that's sweeping the nation that I really don't know anything about. But check with your local animal shelters. They're encouraging people who are out hunting Pokemon to stop by and take one of the, the shelter dogs for a walk. They don't care that you're looking for Pokemon. They're just like, hey, we're out playing in the air and I'm walking around. So something to think about. Yeah, our local uh, shelter here had a, a deal this weekend that if you came in and mentioned Pokemon, and uh, you could, I, th I believe it was, uh, they dropped the adoption fees for animals. For the That's weekend. awesome. Yeah, so people are doing that stuff. But yeah, definitely, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good idea, because yeah, we both have volunteered at animal shelters in the past, that, um, you know, if you can go in and, and, and you're, they have a program where you can walk the dogs. It's cool just to go walk the dogs. Mm -hmm. The dogs absolutely love it. They love it. And it they really get helps outside them, and, and it helps them socialize and stuff like that. And it's usually, it's, it's a lot of fun. The dogs are usually very friendly and they're just so excited to be outside and, and, and happy. So, yeah, that's uh, something to check out. And um, I, I think at this point, honestly, we're going to go to the interview because it's, it's really long. And I know you guys really want to hear horror stuff. And we, we, haven't, like we, haven't, we haven't seen any horror movies lately other than Secret Life of Pets. So. That was not a horror movie. <laughs> that was wonderful. <laughs> Something for everyone. Maybe a little dark at points for some kids. So Sort of really kind of is kind of dark at some there points. Are, there are points in that movie where I'm like, wow, this is pretty dark for a kid's movie. I, that's what I, I just called a horror movie just to upset you. Kind of like I call those, those uh, Lifetime um, oh. Channel or what is it? Hallmark Channel. Hallmark Channel. Hallmark Channel Christmas movies that you watch. Uh, those are those are definitely horror movies. Well, some of them are not. Movies. Some I'm, of them are horrible. Yeah. Some are not. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But uh, we did get to see um, the Secret Life of Pets in adult in a theater full of drunk adults. So hey. Yeah. That, that, that was fun. That was entertaining. That was entertaining. <laughs> More movie theaters should serve alcohol. That's all I'm gonna say. Um, so anyway, let's uh, go to the review. Like I said, it's a uh, it's a uh, John Skip, who if you are familiar with horror, you're certainly gonna be familiar with his work, and uh, filmmaker and author Laura Lee Barr. And uh, we'll be back after that. All right, folks. Uh, we're back now. I don't know what episode number this will be by the time you hear this interview, but we've, we've done a lot of great shows over the last two years. I mean, we've had Brian Smith, Jack Ketchum, F. Paul Wilson, Tom Monteleone, Edward Lee. I mean, just some of the titans of the industry. And we've also had exciting up-and-coming new writers like Damian Angelica Walters, um, you know, Christian Jensen, Adam Caesar, you know, all these folks. And it's just been so awesome. Tonight, we're going to bring you the best of both of those worlds. Um, one of my personal heroes and one of what I feel is one of the best of the new up-and-coming writers. Uh, we're going to have them both on the show. Uh, our first guest is, of course, one of the founders of the Splatterpunk movement. Uh, which forever changed our genre. You've heard us talk about it on previous shows. Um, his books, both solo and in collaboration with others, include The Long Last Call, Conscience, Stupography, The Light at the End, Book of the Dead, The Cleanup, Spore, and many, many more. He's a writer, he's an editor, songwriter, musician, film director, film producer, and I think most importantly, mentor. I am, of course, talking about John Skip. Hi. Welcome to the show, man. Thanks, man. This is a fucking treat. I know. And, and having you here is just wonderful. It is. It is. Yeah. It is. We're yeah. going to get to that in a minute. Uh, but before we do, I also want to introduce the young lady sitting here between us. Mm -hmm. uh, she is the Wonderland Book Award winning author of Haunt 
and long-form religious porn. She's also an actress, screenwriter, and director. Her movies include Boned, Jesus Freak, and The Little Death. She's also a mixologist and the inventor of the Donny Osmond. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't think I read your blog, uh, did you? I am, of course, talking about Laura Lee Barr. Welcome to the show. I'm so happy to be here. Well, we're happy to have you here. So, yeah, we are recording this skip at your home. Um, what... What area is this? What is this called? We are in Eagle Rock, uh, more specifically Mount Washington in Glassell Park. So uh, even the hyphens have hyphens in them uh, <laughs> uh, here. But yeah, we're, we're like uh, between Glendale and Pasadena, just above Echo Park and Silver Lake on the east side of Los Angeles. Okay, and we are sitting high up on his balcony. We're looking down over Los Angeles. The Hollywood Hills are over there. The sun is just going down over them. Um, we're recording it outside. You may hear some incidental traffic in the background or very little. I yeah. Mean. No shootings or anything like that. I, I can't remember the last one I didn't do. Yeah, maybe an earthquake. <laughs> um, can't that, remember the last of those you didn't do either. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's so much fun. No, this is gorgeous, man. And thank you for letting us record here. Yeah, of course. Um, so what we're going to do, we're going to, we're going to start with you. Okay. Um, and, uh, Laura, we're slowly going to work it into you. I, I've got a whole plan. Wait, let me rephrase that because that just sounded all kinds of wrong. Um, you don't seem to care, though. No. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't sound wrong to me. Okay. Oh, well. <laughs> all right. Well, now. We're, we're uh, in California. I hear all sorts of things. <laughs> I have a plan. I have a roadmap is what I'm saying. Okay. Um, so, John. Yeah. Now, Everybody from my generation, for lack of a better word, that I've had on the show, you know, they all point to you as one of their influences. You know, myself, Brian Smith, uh, you know, of course, our, our dear friend J.F. Gonzalez, who's now passed. You know, we, we all we all point to King. We all point to the Splatterpunks. We point to Lame and Ketchum. Um Growing up, what was it? What was it for you? Was it was it Block? Was it Lovecraft? Oh shit! Um, well, it all started with Dr. Seuss. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I made my way to uh, Creepy Magazine, where I got introduced to Edgar Allan Poe, uh, Ambrose Bierce, Bram Stoker, and those guys. Then I went to um, I was living in Argentina at this point, and uh, I could get the British paperbacks, the uh, Pan collections of great horror stories and Fontana collections of great horror stories. So, uh, and also Alfred Hitchcock's collections, like stories they wouldn't let me do on TV. Right. Um, somewhere in there, I found everything from, you know, uh, Lord Dunsany and Nathaniel Hawthorne and uh, Daphne de Moyer and uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to the guys like Robert Block and Ray Bradbury. Got on a total fucking uh, Ray Bradbury bender and... Uh, uh, Lord of the Flies was a huge one and uh, then from there it was like underground comics um, crazy zap comics and slow Crumb, stuff like yeah, that well, and, and uh, slow death uh, eco funnies which did like skull comics and stuff like that with uh, Richard Corbin um, this, these were the first uh, comics where I ever saw where people uh, had you know enormous dicks and their brains flew out um, <laughs> and uh, and I was like, okay, so basically I can do anything. And then I started reading Harlan Ellison and uh, Phil K. Dick and uh, the new wave of science fiction, Kurt Vonnegut Jr. Um, so horror was not one of the biggest influences um, as a as a reader during that period. Catch-22 was huge for me. Right. Um, um, and then... But I mean, I always liked it, uh, uh, and I loved, you know, the ones that I found when I read The Exorcist. I was like, okay, this is the shit. Um, Exorcist was huge for me, um, and uh, then I started writing, and I'm writing. I, I started writing music. I wrote tons of music. I wrote like a couple of rock operas about uh, saving the world and blah blah blah, uh, and that's what the first couple of books were about. Very social change social conscious oriented stuff but with extreme moments of ultra violence in yeah. them and um um that was when my friend Len leslie sternberg said have you ever read stephen king because you write a lot like him and i think he would probably like him and i'm like what why uh, he's a best-selling author right i, I assumed he sucked and, <laughs> and she's like no no he's really good you should read the stand and i read the stand and i went oh holy fuck um 
he sold five million copies of this thing where you know people start out like puking in the gas station and before you know it uh you know uh half the world half of america no what like 80 percent of america is dead yeah and everybody's like stepping over the bodies and stuff i'm like okay this is great shit and again it, it really spoke to um both my populist uh sentiments and my hardcore again harlan Ellison w- was huge i mean uh whimper of whip dogs and bleeding stones and i have no mouth and i must scream and, and all that, that stuff informed my my splatterpunk vocabulary i think more than almost anyone really even yeah. even more than uh, the underground comics um well because he was doing it with prose yeah you know i mean uh imagistically I was dialing from a lot of that stuff, but again, he was a very fearless writer and, and just, you know, lived for the opportunity to, to blow shit up in people's brain stems. Yeah. And, uh, that was a quality I very much admired. Uh, and so when I started actually, you know, it was interesting. Um, then I heard about, uh, Twilight Zone magazine forming and they were, uh, having a contest and the judges were Harlan, Peter Straub, Stephen King, uh, Carol Serling, uh, Rod's widow. And, uh, I was like, I'm going to try and write something for that. Right. So, um, I had written this short story for my mom, a Christmas story. Was that the long ride? No, no, no. no okay. No, it, it was a story. Uh, I can't even remember what the name was like, you know, Christmas for Jackie or something like that. And, um, uh, so I kind of grafted this ghost narrative into it and sent it in. And uh, Ted Klein wrote me back, the editor of Twilight Zone, and he said, you know, this is a really, really good story, but the, the ghost element seemed like sort of grafted on. <laughs> I was like, man, this guy's a good editor. Uh, an excellent taste. So, um, so then when I moved to New York, um, my first job was working as a, uh, a painter painting the uh, studio loft of a uh, penthouse photographer named uh, Hank Londoner. So he, he shot like beautiful naked women in his, uh, in his loft. And um, um, one day he calls me up and says, I have a session, so I need you not to paint today. So um, I left and I uh, went to the pizza parlor on the corner, got a slice, and on the radio they said, 12 cab drivers have been murdered so far this summer uh, in the city. And I went, bing, and I went down the street, got a six-pack of beer, a pack of cigarettes, uh, wrote a story called The Long Ride that night, and then the next day I walked into Twilight Zone magazine and uh, said I'd like to see Ted Klein, please. You walked into the office? Yes. Wow. Yeah, I walked into the office and said I'd like to see Ted Klein. Uh, my name's John Skip. I'm a writer. Uh, uh, he's read my stuff. And uh, they let me back. And I said, I, I wrote you a story. And um, and they were all looking at me like, <laughs> look at this fucking guy. Um, uh, but then, you know, a couple weeks later, I got a letter back from him saying, I really like this story. I'm going to buy it. And uh, and that's how that shit happened. Now, was he cool when you walked in? or I mean, he, he, he was a little, uh, I mean, you know, he, he's a strong guy and he's a smart guy. Uh, and he's used to dealing with uh, with people, but I don't think that what I did is something that happens very often. Yeah. Um, and that's ballsy. Yeah. I was just like, well, I, I knew, I knew the story was good. Right. You know, I knew that I I nailed something, and um, I was like, fuck it, I, I could send this to him and hope for the best, or I could walk the 15 blocks from my apartment to the office and take the elevator up and. Uh, and uh, wipe the sweat off my brow and say, hi, I'm here to, <laughs> uh, to bring Ted a story. Um, and, uh, yeah. Do you ever think back on it and think, what if I hadn't done that? What if I had sent it in snail mail? No, I don't think about that. No? Because it didn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Uh, it's it's one, of, one of the many things I'm relieved of having to think of. Because <laughs> it didn't fucking happen. No, we're already off the show notes here, Laura. So I'm just, I'm just going to roll with stream of consciousness. Mm-hmm. Um, Harlan Ellison. Mm-hmm. So he, you really looked up to Harlan. Oh, yeah. Now... You, 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 of course, you, we've been friends for years. You know, you know my feelings on Harlan, um, and I'm sure the listening audience by now knows my feelings on Harlan. Uh-huh. Um, he's a strong personality in yes, person. Yes. Were you taken aback when you first met him, and over the years, or does he still remain that that guiding principal star? Well, you know, I've seen Harlan be very mean, and I've seen Harlan be very uh, uh, beneficent. Yeah, and. Um, 
uh, okay, here's how I met Harlan Ellison. Uh, it was at a comic convention. Uh, this was years before I wrote uh, my first story, and it was actually my first trip to New York City with, with Leslie. Um, and uh, I got a wild hair in my head. I was going to write a song for Harlan. <laughs> Because <laughs> because uh, that's what I was that, that was my communication modality at that time. Um, so uh, he's doing his big lecture, uh, and then at a certain point he opens it up to questions, and I raised my hand and I said, um, uh, "I wrote you a song. Can I can I play it for you?" <laughs> so he brought me up on fucking stage and held the mic while I sang that song for him. Do you remember wow. the song? Uh, it, yeah, it's called "Some Balls Will Roll." <laughs> <laughs> It was actually a very pretty song, but it got kind of powerful in the in the middle there. Um, <laughs> See, I knew none of this. We Skip and I were at a world horror in New York City years and years ago. It's actually a, it was a great world horror. Monica J O'Rourke mm-hmm. organized it, but they put me on a panel on Sunday with Harlan. Now, whether you love Harlan or whether you don't care for Harlan, one thing you you cannot deny when Harlan is on a panel. There's no sense in putting other panelists on it because he will dominate the panel mm-hmm. for however long it's supposed to be. And it was Sunday, and I was tired, and I still had to drive back to Pennsylvania, and I didn't want to do the fucking panel because I knew I wouldn't be nice to Harlan, and I didn't want to be that guy. So I paid Skip. What was it like sixty bucks or something like that? <laughs> it was like sixty bucks. Yeah, I'm like, if I give you sixty bucks in cash, will you take my place on that panel? And he's like, sure, I'll be. So I give him the money. I, I needed the sixty bucks. Yeah, and he goes in and he doesn't say a word for an hour. He just <laughs> I laughed a lot. He's also very funny. The dude is, is very, very. The funny. guy's funny. I, yeah. I'll give you. I'll give you that. You know, but oh man. So oh um so. I just remembered the chorus of the song. Oh, God. Can you sing it for us? Yeah, I think so. Something like, No more, no more, you bastard so arrogant and blind. The words would stick in your throat if you ever let it into your mind. I say a prayer that you will dare to dig yourself from out of that hole. But in time, that time, I swear some balls will roll. Oh. Wow. Ah! Ah! Uh. Oh, Dave, why are you not here? You still got one hell of a set of pipes on you, brother. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, you, you know, that, that segs in. Um, you know, in the 70s and the 80s, you're in, you're in York, Pennsylvania, my hometown, um, and you're in a band, Arcade. Mm-hmm. Had an had a album released, a 45 released. Mm-hmm. Um, what were you first? Were you a writer first, or were you a musician first? What was your first love? Um, my first love was music and drawing. Yeah. Um, but I loved books from the beginning. I mean, when my sisters would uh, uh, read Dr. Seuss to me, uh, or my mom, um, very quickly they said that I was reading the page, the next page, as they were turning the last ones, because I was memorizing it. Um, and I re- he made, really made me fall in love with words. Um, and pictures. Right. Um, but no, music totally got me. Music was going to be the thing that I did. But uh, I also, you know, whenever I had an English assignment, I would write crazy shit. Right. And um, realize that I liked it and, 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 and had a, an aptitude for it. And so, like, in junior high, in eighth grade, when I moved back to the States, uh, I became the creative writing editor of the school newspaper and wrote short stories and edited other people's stories and poems, and I wrote the school play. Uh, So I was always doing all these different things, but I thought I I thought I was going to be a rock star. Rock star was uh, where I thought I was going, and it it didn't work out that way. Well, now I mean, you've done some stuff with uh, Chris Poland from Megadeth. Yes, I have. You know, you had Arcade. Mm -hmm. Um, You and Craig Spector. You know, you did the Bridge soundtrack. Mm -hmm. I mean. you did. You had some accomplishments in music, but yeah, obviously it never took off the way writing did. Do you ever? Do you ever regret that looking back? Um, I regret that my music didn't do better, but I think I like being a writer more than I'd like being a touring musician. Yeah. Um, and I think that probably all of my excellent uh, 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 substance. Uh, habits would have probably taken me out a lot younger as a musician than they did as a writer. I could see that. Yeah, yeah. I could totally see that happening. Um, and uh, no, music is like this huge ache in me that uh, that 
uh, I hope to release somehow better before I'm out of here. Yeah. Um, I think I'm going to take some time. I've actually written like five songs this year, which is more songs than I've written in, in a really long time. Um, and don't forget, I did the um, the soundtrack. I, I wrote all the songs for Misty Beethoven. Oh, musical. well, I've got I've got a whole line of questioning about Misty Beethoven. Right on. Okay. So, <laughs> so okay, we we talked about your first story in Twilight Zone, which we were we were talking before we started recording. I I remember reading that issue, hmm. um, and I was explaining to Laura, you know, the whole Splatterpunks thing. You know, it's it's you and Craig, it's David Scow, it's it's Lansdale. R.C. Matheson, and, you know, these aren't writers in tweed jackets smoking pipes. I mean, the, these motherfuckers look like <laughs> us. You know, I, I was I was explaining to Laura, I used to read Twilight Zone and Horror Show and a Mystery Scene. Mary San Giovanni has this great old issue of Mystery Scene with mm. pictures from a con, and it's, it's all the writers in their, you know, their tweed smoking jackets. Yeah. Uh, Tom Monteleone and F. Paul Wilson, who look like Herb Tarlick out of out of WKRP, they're dressed like that, and then and then it's you guys, right? you know, the fucking black leather and the cool hair. I, I, I was playing to Laura, you know, it was like Tiger Beat magazine to me. I this, you know, this, oh my god, you know, these are our writers. Wow. How did you guys all meet? Like, how did you meet Craig? How did that come about? Um, Craig and I met as high school. Well, I, I dropped out of high school, and he got kicked out of high school. Um, within two weeks of each other from two different high schools in, in York. I, right. I, I quit Central, and he got kicked out of Dallastown. Um, and we both wound up at this little school called York Country Day School, which was a school for troubled kids and or kids um, with money and or kids with some sort of government or educational connection. Um, and and those of us who, who couldn't afford to go to York County Day School, we had to go to York Votech mm -hmm. uh, for their, their remedial classes which is where i ended up in 11th grade because i was also a troubled youth but. and they barely got me into that school i mean I, I was sort of like um i just quit a school because i didn't want to be in schools yeah. I, I think the message was i don't want to be in schools um but then uh, i went there and uh they had a smoking lounge <laughs> for, oh, no. for 11th and 12th graders and i said okay fuck it i think i can do this um, and um and um you know, getting high in the parking lot and stuff. And then my first day of school, um, I walk in and uh, into the smoking lounge. King Crimson's uh, Lark's Tongues in Aspic is playing. And um, um, there's this really cute girl leaning over the shoulder of this long-haired dude and laughing her ass off. And I look and he's drawing this insane cartoon. And... I said, Robert Crumb, and he turned around and looked at me like, went, yeah, and um, that was Craig Spector. And so we immediately became fast friends based on our uh, uh, exquisite taste in fucked up art. Right. And um, um, we started hanging out all the time. I taught him how to play guitar. Um, we started being in, in bands, and, uh, and that, was, that was that shit, you know. Those were good years. Yeah. Yeah. And eventually, you guys... You hook up with Dave Scow. You meet Lansdale. I mean, was oh. it just through the convention circuit? Yeah, totally. Yeah. totally. Um, what was happening, I mean, I went to conventions by myself before Craig and I wrote The Light at the End, and I was like the weird uh, guy. I, I, I was one of I was one of the weird young guys that didn't know anybody and was just trying to figure shit out. I did not have uh, 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 black leather on at that time. I still had my uh, long hippie hair and shit. Right. Um, and the big beard. Um, uh, and Doug Winter and uh, Dennis Etchison were the two guys that kind of looked at me and went, oh, you kid. You, know? <laughs> you, you look like you're smart and you mean well. Uh, we'll talk to you a little bit. Um, a lot of the other guys were, who the fuck is this guy? Um, and then the light at the end hit, and all of a sudden we were best-selling authors out right. of nowhere, and, and so that kid all of a sudden just took off, and here he is with his buddy. Right about the same time, uh, um, Scow starts showing up with his stories in Twilight Zone. He won a, the only Twilight Zone uh, short fiction award there was. Oh, I so, remember. So uh, I went to that ceremony because I was a huge fan of Oliver Lowenbrook, the author of the story, <laughs> written under a pseudonym. Um, and uh, when it was over, I was like, dude, uh, let's go out drinking. And so uh, 
I took him to my neighborhood bar on, uh, uh, was it like 25th Street and 9th Avenue in Chelsea? Right. And uh, hung out. I offered him cocaine. He said, I don't do cocaine. I said, ah, I, I don't really do it either. And then I did some cocaine. Uh, <laughs> cocaine, by the way, is the stupidest drug I ever did uh, on purpose. Um, and uh, that, did, that my love affair with that lasted very, very briefly. Um, I, I wrote the first 200 pages of the cleanup on cocaine. See that was that was an apocryphal question I had for you later, and you've just answered it. Except for there was only one good sentence in it, so I had to throw the entire two hundred pages out <laughs> and throw out the rest of the cocaine, and, and then I could write a book. Uh, can I can I ask you another one real quick? Sure. Now, and I don't know if it's true or not. That's why I say it's apocryphal. There's an apocryphal story that uh, you wrote part of Animals on acid, and that. And that it was it was a series of just random letters. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, that that is half accurate. Okay. In the Skip Inspector books, there would always be one chapter that I wrote on acid. Yeah. I wrote one chapter of every single Skip Inspector book on acid. Um, and um, actually, the um, the chapter I wrote on acid was uh, uh, Nora's first time she fucks the main character. Okay. And it's pretty much word for word what I wrote. Is it really? Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, no. I write well on acid. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. Yeah, I, I write well high. So you guys, you, you all meet up. Eventually, David coins the term splatterpunk. Mm -hmm. And boom. I mean, you, you had no idea at the time what an impact that would have. What, yeah. what, do, you, what do you think looking back? Um, well, I'll tell you. Um. I think that literary movements with funny names are swell. Um, you know, I, I'm in, deeply involved with Bizarro now, right. uh, another funny name. And um, uh, they're great for getting attention. Uh, they're also great for being dismissed over. And, uh, yeah, I mean, basically my experience then was that uh, obviously, a lot of people liked this stuff and were buying it, but a lot of people felt that we were, you know, nothing but trouble. That we oh, were yeah. The death of, of the, the genre. I mean, at the, at the time, Charles Grant was was writing angry letters to Twilight Zone about you guys. Uh, William F. Nolan mm -hmm. uh, wrote a, a scathing essay about you in particular. Well, it would have been scathing if it had been any good. Uh, <laughs> but, but the, you know, again, man, I, I fucking love William F. Nolan now. We just had a very, very rocky beginning. Right. Um, and, yeah, yeah, I mean, we, we alienated these guys. Uh, um, they, they were moving at a very different frequency than we were. We, we were pretty jacked up. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, they they were doing chamber music and we were uh, – and, and we were rocking out. Yeah. And, um, and you know, we were spoiling their, their chamber music, and uh, we were too loud, so, which is, you know, loud versus quiet horror, which was a very hilarious phenomenon, um, especially when you consider that we really like quiet horror, too. We just uh, would intersperse it with big, loud things. Right. And what happened was is that people didn't notice all of the subtle human stuff that we were doing because the big stuff was so big that they forgot that anything else happened. It was like their ears were still ringing and they couldn't read the chapters where, you know, the serious human stuff was going on. So we were basically uh, carnographers. We were meat porn people. You know, we, we uh, uh, in the days before torture porn, because we weren't torturistic. Right. Um, we, were, we were working other angles, but it was very savage. It was very physical and very engaged. Um, so... That was all cool. Now what's really interesting when I think about Splatterpunk is that I feel like, okay, the word's in the dictionary, and that's lovely, but the definition is wrong, in my opinion. Right. Um, how, how would you define it? Well, the splatter is obvious, but what I feel is missing is the punk, which was the subversive uh, anti- uh, authoritarian anti-establishment attitude, right. uh, the sort of, you know, fuck with the lights on and, and party all night uh, vibe. And um, and I feel like extreme horror was splatter without the punk to, to in many, many, many ways. And 
to think that they're the same thing is not to me accurate. I don't. Yeah, I would agree with you. I and you know I've been branded an extreme horror writer. Mm -hmm. It's it's not. I Which guess occasionally you are. But occasionally you, but, I am. But that's not what you. Uh, that's not what I would. I, I I've, I've actually talked with with Joe Lansdale about this. You know, mm -hmm. privately. Um. You know, he he was branded a splatterpunk, and yes. occasionally he was. Right. But he was really a genre unto himself. He was yes. Joe Lansdale. Exactly. Um. Occasionally I get called extreme horror, but not every. I mean, you can't read Where We Live and Die, for example, and mm -hmm. and there's nothing extreme about that book. Um. Yeah. I I've never seen extreme horror as the the child of splatterpunk. Mm -hmm. I I think extreme horror stems partly from I I think splatterpunk is its mother, and you know Richard Lame and Jack Ketchum, mm -hmm. uh, Rex Miller, mm -hmm. none of whom were really thought of splatterpunk. No, as you know Edward Lee, yeah. as as its father. I think it's a combination of the two, but I would agree. There's a lot of extreme horror these days that's just extreme for extreme sake. Yeah, I mean, it, it really is just um, how far can we take this horrible thing uh, and, uh, you know, how how deeply can we nail its head through the floor and how far can we make it squirt and how many things uh, can, you know, how many holes can we fuck it in? Right. Um, I do think there are authors, though, under the extreme banner that, that transcend that, that get back to splatterpunk. Um, C.V. Hunt's Ritualistic Human Sacrifice, which I just read. Have, have, have either of you read that? No, I'm yeah. re that's on my list. Oh, my God. Yeah? Oh, my God. Cool. 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 Um, you know, Brian Smith, obviously. Right. Monica J. O'Rourke. Mm -hmm. um, Wrath, on occasion. Mm -hmm. That's what I like about Wrath. Sometimes Wrath is... is it's straight up Edward Lee, mm -hmm. and sometimes, yeah, you, you can see him leaning towards you guys. Um, you know, and then there's crazy fuckers like Cody Goodfellow. Oh, Cody, yeah. yeah uh, Cody is a genre unto himself. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> but but to me, he he got the splatter punk, he got the punk in the splatter uh, right. Yeah. You know, like, you know, right and, and beyond right. He's uh, bizarro punk. Oh, yeah. Um, he, But again, I mean... All genres melt beneath his gaze. You know, that's, that's just kind of how oh my works. god, that's the greatest cover blurb of all time. <laughs> this is true, man. Cody, if if you're listening, man, you you need to steal that right now. All genres melt beneath his gaze. <laughs> oh wow. So, all right. So, light at the end. Uh, Bannon purchases it in what, 1984? It's published in 86. Mm -hmm. Sells over a million copies worldwide. Uh -huh. um, before it was published, you got you and Craig had actually collaborated on the Fright Night novelization. Yes. Um, and then, boom, you're rock stars. You mm -hmm. do five more original horror novels together over mm -hmm. six years. Um, you know, then you did uh, Book of the Dead, mm -hmm. which again, the the influence and the impact that anthology has had in the decades since cannot be understated. Um, that was eighty nine. Yep. Uh, when it came out. Yeah. yeah. You know, you guys, uh, you wrote the screenplay for A Nightmare on Elm Street Five: The Dream Child. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. Which that's a whole other show in itself. But do you have anything you want to say on that? Oh. Uh, uh, you know, everything that I have to say um, is on Never Sleep Again, the Elm Street Legacy, the, yeah. the giant documentary that uh, Andrew Cashin and, and uh, Dan Fern did. And, um, yeah, half of it is in the movie. The other half is in the special features, where, which are as long as the movie. Right. Uh, where I get to say even more and substantially funnier stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, it, it, it was a hellish experience. And... Um, um, really let me know uh, how bad my ass is going to get kicked in Hollywood, but I still came here anyway to get kicked harder. Um, but it let me know that if I was going to make movies, I was going to have to learn how to make movies because being a writer in Hollywood is worse than being a fry cook in fucking McDonald's. Wow, uh, that's a for, bold statement. Um, um, except for um, if you have any control over it or if you don't you know, care. Because right. you can make a shitload of money. There's a lot of people making uh, more money than I will make in my entire life um, doing things, writing things that will never be produced, that will never be seen. So it's just basically ghostwriting uh, for the void. Uh, but you well, you know, of sp speaking of ghostwriting in Hollywood, now you wrote uh, Class of 1999, but you were un you were uncredited on it, right? Yeah, yeah. 
No, was that you and Craig both, or was yes. that a that was a so? Now how come you guys didn't get the credit? Um, well, because um, they only used a certain amount of our stuff. We 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 didn't ghostwrite. We we basically we came in as script doctors, right? Um, and we were flown in during the writer's strike because we weren't guild writers at, at the recommendation of, of several highly placed or uh, people who uh, whose name I won't mention, so they won't get pissed off. Um, but uh, we landed, we rode for several weeks, uh, they put us up in the Beverly Hilton uh, uh, with uh, only the finest cable TV and, uh, and prostitutes, and, um, and then one day we get a phone call from Harlan Ellison uh, going, what the fuck are you doing, you idiots? Uh, are you stu- did you just fall off the truck? Are you stupid? He had heard, he had been told uh, that we were scabbing and that we were killing our careers. Wow. Uh, and so he was like, leave the hotel right now, come to my house, um, and um, I will uh, protect you, and then I will walk you into the Writers Guild where you will crawl in on your knees and explain that you're stupid. Um, <laughs> and we're like, but we're not scabbing. And uh, uh, we confirmed that that was the case. And then Harlan was like, oh, okay, well, you want me to tell you who told everybody, who's telling everybody in the world right now that you're in Hollywood scabbing and is trying to nuke your career? Who was it? Um, he's dead now. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I will let his, right. his memory uh, rest in peace. All him. right. But, uh, yeah, w- 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 uh, what an asshole. Um and uh, and then it all blew back on him, and uh, uh, we finished our gig. We got fired um, after five weeks. Uh, we handed a, a, our, our pages into them. We're sitting around the Obsidian uh, boardroom table, and uh, the producer uh, calls from New York and says, eh, "That's stupid." <laughs> and I went. I, I could see Craig was about to lose his shit, but I, I this huge piece. Uh, just washed over me and I went wait a minute they don't want us to write something good they just want us to convince them that their stupid movie is good and then they'll let us go home Um, and at that point I I had the very liberating experience of going okay I don't have to write good I have to write uh, hilarious bad Uh, and I'll tell you there's there's like 40% more stuff that I actually wrote in class of 1999 than there is in Nightmare on Elm Street 5, The Dream Child. Really? Yes. Uh, and a couple of those speeches like that uh, I wrote are, are still in there intact. But then they brought in a couple other writers, including, what is her name? Uh, uh, something, well, the, the one who wrote Sid and Nancy. She I know who you mean, and, yeah. And, and she, she did a, another pass on it. And ultimately, the screenplay credit went to the guy who originally wrote it, right? Because uh, there was still probably more fundamentally of his script in there than than ours. But uh, we we changed everything, uh, um, and a lot of the ideas that we worked with. Again, once I realized that it wasn't my job to come up with good ideas, um, we just met with the, the effects guys, and they said, "Here's what we can do for the for the budget that they." Have are offering us right and we listen to their gags we use their fucking gags those are the gags in the movie that's pretty much the same exact experience jesus and i had with sci-fi channel Mm -hmm. and neandra zombie yeah (laughs) oh yeah no no it's bullshit like i said man uh as william goldman uh one of my other great mentors uh who i've never met but who i learned so much from said um if you want to be a screenwriter you have you better have something else that you really love uh because uh, that, that you get uh, uh, emotional satisfaction from because you ain't going to get it there. Yeah. Um, you know, you may make a lot of money and every once in a while a movie may turn out okay, but uh, yeah, they'll run you through the fucking ringer. And uh, uh, I don't jump through hoops well, um, which is why I had to become a director, which is why I am now a director. And why you do it yourself. Well, but you don't do it yourself. You, you create a team um, in which... Um, Y'all do it yourselves, right? You know um, where, uh, and my role is very, very clear. But you also, you, you know, assembling a film crew to me is like assembling uh, uh, a bank heist. You know, um, 
where you're, you're basically okay. You're, you're the safe cracker. Uh, you're the driver. You're uh, the demolitions expert. Uh, uh, you're the sweet talker. Uh, everybody's got a job and they need to know how to do it. And if anybody fails, uh, the whole thing goes down. So you assemble a crack fucking team and you go in and you kill the thing. Right. And that's how you do it. And uh, I like assembling teams. That's what I've been doing wrong, Laura. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, banks too, but <laughs> the statute of limitations isn't up on that. So, you know, we I, I mentioned Jesus a little a little bit ago. Um, you know, Jesus, Buddy Martinez, Mark Williams, you got to know them oh, when yeah. you and Craig moved out here. You, you you have any favorite memories, first impressions? Oh well, they descended on one of our uh, uh, book signings, and they were these fun, uh, uh, long haired. Uh, LA Latino uh, metal dudes and uh, they were just so happy and so full of energy and uh, they invited us back to party at their place so we all went back to Buddy's place and drank a shitload of beer and got real high and listened to music and laughed and talked and laughed and talked and yeah. that was pretty much that you know Jesus b- before he passed he and I had been talking he I convinced him you know, I, I've always said, out of anybody of our generation, he had the front row seat to all that. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. this is a young man who is driving Robert Block to the grocery store, mm-hmm. who is is partying with Skip Inspector and Scal, and I mean, who's just seeing all this go down. And I always thought there was a book in that mm. that a bunch of us would fucking read, and I had convinced him to write it right before he passed. Uh. Uh, I found some very basic notes he had made towards it, but of course it never got written. Yeah, yeah. But mm. yeah, it's a hell. Uh, that would have been a hell of a book. And all, all three of those guys are gone now. You know, it's it's weird. But yeah. uh, so all right, you finish Nightmare on Elm Street, and then you and Craig break up. Oh um, no 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 no. Um, uh, we got fired off Nightmare on Elm Street the same day that. I decided that the story that we were writing for Book of the Dead wasn't any good, right? Uh, and that we should just drop it because it wasn't worthy of the other stories we were getting, right? And uh, putting a half-ass story by us in the book would have lamed it up seriously. Um, so Craig and I had that discussion. Ten minutes later, the phone rang from New Line telling us we were fired. So that was a really good day. It was a bad day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think good means what you think it means. <laughs> I, I, I think it means exactly what I think it means because I'm lying. Um, but uh, um, no, no, Craig and I hung in for a couple years past that. Month. Did you? Okay, oh, yeah. I've got my timeline wrong. No, then. no, Craig and I busted up um, when we were in L.A. Uh, um, around the writing of Animals, the book, and uh, the resultant uh, film. Basically... Animals was not supposed to be the book after The Bridge. Right. Uh, there was a book that Craig and I spent about, I don't know, six to eight months uh, researching and preparing. We wanted to do something that would be a comeback because Deadlines in The Bridge did not sell for shit after, uh, you know, The Light at the End, The Cleanup and The Scream all hit a million or close. Right. Um, and uh, so it was going to be a big comeback novel. Um um, and we spent all this time working on it, but meanwhile I was thinking, you know, it's really time to get to L.A., and I came up with this pitch for the first movie to pitch, which was Animals, um, which was basically Jonathan Demme's Something Wild with Werewolves in uh, Pennsylvania Steel Town. Right. Um, uh, I, I really fell in love with, with Something Wild and, and the relationship dynamics, the love triangle of it. I went, you know, what if, what if that chick was a werewolf, and uh, Ray Liotta was too, and how much scarier would that be? Um, and uh, so I had that pitch prepared, and then we got the news that Bantam was, uh, got our big. They got they got a two hundred page document from us describing the thousand page novel we were going to write, <laughs> and they offered us like one tenth of what we were being paid, and we were like, oh. You know, my, my agent said, sit down before we tell you this, and I laughed, uh, but I sat down, and it was really good because I almost fainted. It's one of the only times I've actually ever almost fainted from somebody saying words to me. Yeah. Uh, and we went, okay, fuck, we're doomed unless we have a, a, a book we want to pitch to you right now uh, that 
will hopefully give you some reason to give us more money this than this shameful uh, uh, Kmart uh, discount that you're offering us. And uh, we drove up to uh, New York at 90 miles an hour, uh, and I pitched them animals, and they gave us a decent amount of money, and that's what kept us going long enough to uh, to make it to the end. Yeah, yeah. and I I I'm fairly certain you probably we probably don't want to get into dollar amounts on the air, but uh, but, but I know you know as a, as an anecdote I I can I can tell the listening audience you know I I know what you guys used to get paid because you told me because mm-hmm. you were gone for a while when you came back. Um, and you, you, you got an offer mm-hmm. from Dorchester, from Leisure. And I, and I remember you contacted me. I don't, I don't know if you remember this or not. And you said, can I, can I ask you what you're getting per book? And I told you. And you're, you're like, they only offered me this. Mm-hmm. Here's what we were getting back in the day. Here's what Craig and I were getting. And I was, first of all, I was stunned that they, they were paying me more money than they were John fucking Skip. Mm. But second of all, I was stunned by how much they were getting back in the day. Yeah. And then Skip completely puts the nail in my coffin by saying you know your only crime was you were you were born too late you started this too late if you've been writing back then, <laughs> you're but, gonna have those uh, whopping paychecks too uh, and again i mean they were not huge paychecks but they were decent middle class income dude you know? for guys from central pennsylvania it was fucking that good. was life-changing money oh of course it was. you know of course it was jesus um, so eventually you guys stop collaborating. Um, mm-hmm. Now look, you're one of my dearest friends. I'm not. We're not going to talk about anything you don't want to talk about. Thank you very much. But was was it amicable? Was it? No. Was it? No. 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 Ever no. ever think you would work on anything ever again? I mean, together? Yeah. No. No. Okay. No. No. That, that that was the point. And Craig pretty much feels the same way. I don't know what Craig feels, but I can tell you what I do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, professionally, you guys, you you. Uh, your work is still reprinted on occasion. Yeah. There's still foreign right sales. So professionally, it's it's good terms, but good. creatively, you would you would never work with him again. I'm very proud of the work we did together, uh, and I'm very proud of him for everything that he did in the process of doing it. Um, but we went in very very different directions, and uh, yeah, there's just no reason on earth for that to happen. For right. Me. Uh, uh, I have spent the rest of my life doing everything else right yeah which, after, which was the idea after that you disappeared for a while um i yeah. mean you know it's i know where you went you know obviously in, in talking off the air mm-hmm. listening audience doesn't it, it seemed at the time to coincide with the collapse of horror it's like skip and Spectre break up and suddenly there's no more horror novels at the bookstore laura um i i feel personally responsible yeah um no, no, but I mean that—that that was a, a scaffolding that caved in under all of our feet. Um, um, I don't know. I mean, honestly, I didn't have anything left to bring to the game right then, except for my completely broken soul. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I found a, a shithole apartment in Hollywood and uh, uh, curled up into a fetal ball and screamed for a that's, year and a half. That's what I—that's what I picture. Like, 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 dude, like a dog that got hit by a car and crawls under the porch to die. What? Uh, and, um, and yeah, just basically was like broken and done and just, uh, yeah. I mean, I found my real genuine singing voice at that point because I'm laying there in a fetal ball, uh, in the, curled up in the middle of my little apartment, uh, uh, screaming yeah. and just making these terrible noises. And part of me is going like, Fuck! I want to die! I want to die! I want to die! The other part of me is going, but but did you hear that note you just hit? That was awesome. <laughs> that was some John Lee Hooker shit, right? Yeah, there. I, like, <laughs> you know, well, I, I didn't know I had those notes in me, and uh, so yeah, I mean, you know, the beautiful thing about that was that in totally cracking open, I found all this other stuff in myself that uh, that I didn't have access to before, and it took me a long while to to wrestle with it, but then. Uh, uh, I did, and yeah, my, my basic operating line was uh, the last skip broke, so I killed him and ate him. <laughs> and, and, um, and as soon as I, I and, as, and as soon as I grow a new one, I'll let you know. And it took a while. I mean, it really, honestly, it took like 13 years, uh, uh, in which uh, innumerable adventures happen. Many of them at like one inch from uh, from homeless level. Right. Um, 
and uh, yeah, that, that I managed to actually scrape through and uh, reconstitute my soul to this extent uh, is amazing to me. Um, but uh, I think uh, I, I like the skip that grew back better than I liked the one that broke. Yeah. If I'd liked the one who broke better, maybe I wouldn't have had to. Uh, but I mean, to write the shit that I was writing, the really, really dark and painful shit, particularly when you look at a book like The Cleanup, um, um, yeah, I was a very angry and damaged young fellow. And um, I had a lot of shit to work out and uh, have spent the rest of my life doing so. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I wouldn't trade that fucking period for anything. And disappearing was the best thing I could possibly have done. Um, but... Uh, it was fucking weird while it was happening. I will tell you that. So here's my confession. My fantasy job, Laura, has always been... You've seen Straight Outta Compton, right? Yeah. My fantasy gig has always been to write a screenplay based on the Splatterpunks. Ah. Oh. And... And that would be the, yeah. the final bit of the movie yeah. there. You know, like in Straight Outta Compton, when they're all got their solo careers yeah. and Cube's coming up over here and Dre's coming up. I, I'd be focusing on each of them, you know, and, and, and Scow is doing the screenplays and Skip is curled into that ball in his apartment. And, <laughs> yeah. and Lansdale's off just, you know, being Lansdale. Yeah. And, but... Well, one of, it wasn't all bad though. That was during that era. That was that was when you wrote Misty Beethoven, correct? Oh, I'm, I wrote Misty Beethoven. I wrote uh, all the scripts that uh, were in in Chick, Sick Chick Flicks, right? Um, uh, all of which I consider to still be viable. Um, I wrote some other things, and I played in Mumbo's Brain with Chris Paul. That's right. Um, which, which is the thing that actually saved my life. Yeah. Um, and I th those were those uh, the Mumbo's Brain stuff was included on was it a Megadeth CD or was it one of Chris's solo CDs? It was the, a, a Chris solo CD, the Rare Tracks CD, I think, right? Yeah, Rare Tracks Volume One, I think, yeah. and yeah, they they had like five or six cuts off of the Book of Mumbo, which yeah. was the album that we cut. You see any royalties from that? Oh no, no, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I don't know how many of those ever ever actually sold, but honestly. Um, Chris Poland paid the rent on the studio where we rehearsed for the several years. Uh, I was so broke, I was barely able to uh, stay in the tiny shithole apartment I was in. Um, and, uh, yeah, I can't imagine uh, that those CDs made more money than I owed him in rent. So I think it all worked out. I, I have no, no issues on that. Hey, I got to tell you something, man. I need another beer. I need ice for my bourbon. Okay, what should we do? What should we, Laura, do you have a question for John? I'll run and grab him a beer and no, me no, no, ice. No, no, I'll tell you what. I know where the beer and the ice is. All right. Why don't you guys talk for a All right. Me, and I'll be right back. Can we I can do that. Anything else? You like water? You good? Okay. You want one more beer? No. Laura, Laura has to drive me back to my hotel later, which I'm not sure how far that is from here, but you're being very responsible. Yeah, I want to point that I out. Know. It's a great I idea. Point that out. I am. Now, how much of this did you know sitting here listening to this? Probably sixty percent. Yeah. Maybe seventy. Yeah. yeah. But there's been some things that have surprised you. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, because I mean, you know, John is, and correct me if I'm wrong, but he he's been a mentor to you. I mean, he published oh, your first novel, he published your second novel, yeah. he's going to publish your short story collection, yeah. which we're going to talk about in a little bit. Yeah. But had you read him? No. Growing up, no. No. In fact, we met at a an audition. Um, a friend of mine. Um, forwarded a call for a music video right. that he was directing and it was one of those you know um i'd been through a bad breakup i was sitting there it was far away i was like oh do i go to another i'll go i'll go so i drove you know it was, it was a far drive to this audition and that's where and that's good. That's where, now, was he your gateway to the whole Bizarro community? Was that all new yeah. to you as well? Absolutely. Yeah? Yeah. I'd written Haunt, um, and I was sending it out to different publishers, and I gave it to Skip to ask his advice, and he read it, and he said, I know what you should do with this book, except he didn't use that voice. He had a different voice. <laughs> <laughs> that's the worst Skip impression. It's not really an impression. <laughs> well, I know what you should do with this book. <laughs> 
so through that, you were introduced to the whole Bizarro community. Yeah. And, and, I mean, you know, let's be honest right now. I mean, you're the prom queen of the Bizarro crowd. Oh, I that's mean, nice. you're the toast of the town. That's you're so the nice. life of the party. Well, I love... It, it was... The first Bizarro Con I went to, it was, it was one of those amazing feelings of coming home. It's like, oh, maybe... Well, that's exactly it. Child. You know, um, I mean... We're sitting here and we're listening to John talk about you know the splatter punks and how they all met up and they were their they were their own little tribe yeah. and it was it was like that for us as well you know myself Tim Levin Jesus uh, Jeff Cooper Mike Oliveri Mikey Hike Ryan Harding etc you know and and Bizarro it's that same vibe man they watch each other's back yeah you know they help each other. Um, Unfortunately, I see Bizarro going through the same growing pains that we went through and that I, I'm sure the Splatterpunks went through as well. You know, and there's starting to be dissension and this person's getting more more book sales than that person. And that's unfortunate. But yeah. I guess that happens with any literary movement. Yeah, I, I keep myself um, willfully ignorant of most political things. So I yeah. tend to not know such things. You just show up at Bizarro <laughs> I just show up at Bizarro I Con. love everybody. I love you all. Don't tell me anything bad. I don't want to talk shit about anyone. Don't tell me any shit. I don't want to hear it. That tends to be my, my MO. Because, I mean, honestly, I, I really... Um, it, it tends to happen, I think, that sometimes when you um, are in a family, there starts to be tensions that, you know, I'm, I'm from a big family, so I know I know the, the, the deal. So that, right. to me, has been both in my literal family, my bizarre family, and my actual family, um, my survival coping mechanism is to really try to always get along yeah because i i love them i admire that i wish i could do that my survival coping mechanism is to burn it to the ground <laughs> salt the fucking earth and make sure nobody can hurt me ever again well but, if someone fucks me over i'll do that yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. you channel your inner brian keen uh, that's what I, you do? I, I i definitely have an inner brian keen I, do you really i really do i'm i'm my my a lot of my friends will joke they'll be like you know but that basically i'm like i love everyone i love everyone and i'm like i hate this person so much <laughs> because they fucked with your friends the, or yeah, your money well it's it's usually because they fucked with my heart yeah and i don't mean that like like uh like they 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 fucked me over in some way i trusted them and they they fucked me over and then i'm like mm -mm. people suck man they you know kind of they really do honestly yeah that's the um actual the the meaning of the the movie i made the the actual line is dogs are better than people <laughs> <laughs> so you were, you wrote haunt now see this isn't this i did not know about you you wrote haunt before you knew about bizarro yeah before you knew skip and it it seems such a natural fit with bizarro fiction, yeah. but you didn't really know there was a market for that type no. of writing out there. No. no. It's not lost to me that, that while we're talking about burning things to the ground and sawing the earth, there's police sirens behind <laughs> us. Are they here for me? Yeah. Do you have any warrants out? Not, uh, not that I'm aware of, no. but yeah. So, so you wrote it. Did you? I mean, did you send it out to anybody before you gave it to Skip? Or yeah, actually. Um, so the first thing I, I actually, I had written it as a straight choose your own adventure first, and and then I showed it to some of my friends and I sent it to a couple publishers, who gave me notes like this is really great writing but it's to one person said of two so, <laughs> um, so and I ended up just kind of putting it in a box and not looking at it again for about five six years yeah um and then I took it out and I looked at it again and I was a different person at that point and I said you know what I as a reader do not like to actually flip pages and I as a reader what would I want to read and so I went back in and I took out about 200 pages and five plot lines and reworked the whole thing and then that became do you still have those 200 pages and five oh, plot yeah. lines oh yeah can you use them in something else uh can you they, turn them into their own book they'll all they'll always kind of they always kind of come in in their own ways you know they always kind of creep up in their own things but i mean the men in suits definitely were 
a huge part two. And then there was like this really, something that isn't in the book at all is a really creepy, awful Santa Claus. I should use that. For that, oh my God, yes. He, in this, yeah, yeah. There's a novella in that right yeah, there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What happened? Huh? No, no, you got up. She gave me another exclusive. They not hey. even related to her her short story collection. Oh, yeah, it's her upcoming creepy Santa Claus novella. Oh yeah, yeah. That was the it was uh, the original haunt that I wrote before the haunt that I actually wow. wrote had this long plot line in this kind of post apocalyptic world in the desert with this really creepy Santa Claus who ran a. But did you home. ever write an X rated musical? No. no, because you know it's who really did. Fun. You know who did. <laughs> John, John Skip, who's back with us. Hi. And and you know what? You you have perfect timing because I was almost done with my line of questioning for you. Mm. Um, but we do have to talk about Misty Beethoven, okay? Because uh, you know a lot of, a lot a lot of fan a lot of your fans have no idea about this. Jesus! Now we got the ghetto bird flying overhead. We had police sirens. Mm -hmm. You got up to leave, and all hell broke loose. <laughs> um, this tends to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Under the pseudonym Maxwell Lo Maxwell Hart. Yes. You wrote the screenplay and songs for Misty Beethoven, the musical, yes. a musical remake of the adult film, The Opening of Misty Beethoven. That is correct. You won two AVN awards. Mm -hmm. um, for those who don't know what an AVN award is, it's the Bram Stoker Awards of the porno industry. I like to call them the Naked Oscars. They're the Naked Oscars. That's <laughs> even better. Um, you got best sex comedy. Well, I think it's hilarious that the... That, 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 the porn industry has a best sex comedy category. Me too. You know, um, but yeah, God. you got best sex category comedy and most outrageous sex scene, which involved a singing penis. That is correct. It sings a tango. How, how did that come about? Like, okay, you know, we've talked about it. you, you, you've parted ways with your best friend from high school, your writing partner. Um, the industry has collapsed. Mm -hmm. You're learning to sing blues in a way you've never felt them before. Mm -hmm. How does that then go to... To this? To, yeah. Well, okay. Um, I was living in the same house that we're living in right now. And um, the director of Misty Beethoven the Musical uh, is the woman who owns this house. Okay. Um, uh, she, her, her name is Janie, and uh, her porn name was Veronica Hart. She was a, a, a very famous porn star of the late 70s, early 80s. Oh, yes. Uh, and then she became a, a director and producer for VCA Pictures. One day, I came home from work, and there was a copy of the opening of Misty Beethoven, the original um, Radley Metzger film, um, sitting on the table. And I said, what's that doing there? That's my favorite porn movie. That's the, the first one I ever saw. I think it's a masterpiece. And she says, um, well, Russ wants me to remake it. And I said, I would give anything to write the remake of that. And she says, you're hired. <laughs> um, so I'm like, cool. But uh, what she hadn't realized was that uh, I was um, watching a lot of musicals at that particular time. I was watching Forbidden Zone and Hedwig and the Angry Inch right. and uh, Little Shop of Horrors and uh, Phantom of the Paradise and various other things. And so that was really in my head. And um, the next morning, I'm taking a bath, and I hear this dun 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 I'm like, what is that? Oh, it's the opening bars for the opening number of Misty Beethoven the Musical. So I jump out, <laughs> I jump out of the bathtub, and I run downstairs. There's a drum set there and a, a bass and a guitar, and I immediately vamp out the drum beat. And uh, then I call uh, Janie's sons, who are both musicians, and I said, take the drums, play this. Dun, 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 dun. And I, I showed the other guy the bass line, and, uh, and then I went, cool. This sounds like I wanted to sound. Ran upstairs, wrote that song. Um, that quick? Yes. Um, then I got the idea for the penis tango, um, and um, uh, yeah, it's just basically 
you're the proud owner of a big boner. <laughs> I, I'm, I, I'm, your cock, I'm like a rock. I'm your best friend or something. I don't know. Uh, and and I, I wrote the whole thing. I got to the part where it says, uh, now follow the bouncing balls. And this pair of testicles bounces over the lyrics so that everybody can sing along. And um, and I went, okay, I, I got to do this. So Janie comes home and I said, guess what? It's a musical. And she says, shut the fuck up. And I said, no, seriously. And she says, there's no way that's going to happen. And then I played her the songs. And like about three months later, uh, we shot Missy Beethoven the musical. She directed and produced. Uh, I wrote and wrote all the songs and uh, played drums during the live sex acts. So you were on set during the, during the filming uh, for a big chunk of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, again, I, I was the drummer during the live sex scenes shot in the club. Right. Uh, so I have my like fucking Jeff Beck wig on, and uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, we had actual musicians. Chloe, uh, the porn star, is, is a real bass player, so she was actually playing the the bass licks along with it uh, before you know the fucking started, uh, and. Um, it was super fun. Again, I mean, it's a much better movie than Nightmare on Elm Street 5, The Dream. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So eventually, you got the big comeback. Um, you self-published Conscience, mm -hmm. which I told you, you know, off the air, I think it's the best thing you've ever done. Thank you. Um, Stupography. Um, Mondo Zombie came along that won you a Bram Stoker Award for Best Anthology um, you returned to Mass Market with The Long Last Call, you teamed up with Cody Goodfellow for Jake's Wake the day before Spore um, bunch more short stories, bunch more scripts mm -hmm. you're back and you are now and I, I hope you don't take offense at this because I mean it in the highest regard, you're you're the elder statesman of the horror genre. I, I'm a elder statesman of the horror genre. I think you're the. Huh. I think you're the. Um, huh. Rose O'Keefe just posted on Facebook today about how every day around this time, you post your, you know, inspirational. Yeah, your inspirational of the message of the day. Ah. And it's not just hard, dude. I mean, the the entire Bizarro clan looks up to you, and half of them never read a Skip Inspector novel in their right. life. Right. But they they look up to you. Um, you know, you, you look at myself, Jesus, Brian Smith, Monica O'Rourke, Jeremy Robert Johnson, Cody Goodfellow, Jeff Burke, Shane McKenzie. You know, Carlton Malik III. Carlton Malik III. You know, uh, damn. <laughs> well, you know, Justine Musk said an interesting thing to, to me uh, about a year and a half ago. She said, you're kind of like uh, the Velvet Underground. Uh, you, you're, you're not selling that much stuff, but you're inspiring a whole generation of other people to, to do it. Right. Um, and I thought that was very nice. Um, um, you you know, what you hope when you create things is that uh, people will like them. And, uh, and you know, I, I responded very strongly to the people who inspired me, so the idea that I get to inspire people uh, is, is you know, wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have nothing bad to say about that. Do you love mentoring? Is that, like, one of your favorite, most fulfilling things? I like helping people. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think of myself as a mentor, but everybody else does, so I'll accept the word. You are. But um, you are, though. I mean, look... One of the most rewarding things in my life right now is, you know, these guys. Like, I'll use Stephen Kozanowski as, as an example because he he's been on the show. Listeners will be familiar with him. You know, this is a guy that approached Jesus and I at a signing, and he'd read The Rising in high school. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm I'm able to. He he's already gotten published on his own, but I'm I'm able to help guide him. Yeah. Make some better choices, etc. Yeah, yeah. Laura meets you at a casting call. Right. Hands you the manuscript for Haunt. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, you look where she's come. Haunt wins the Wonderland Book Award, her mm -hmm. first novel. Um, you know, the first thing you've purchased as as the editor-in-chief of Fungasm Press, no, if I'm not the, mistaken. The reason I formed Fungasm. Okay, the reason you formed Fungasm. Was that book. Yeah, I mean, that's that's got to feel good, right? Terrible. <laughs> Really? No, no don't either. fuck with me now. I'm halfway through this bottle of knob cream. <laughs> uh, no, no, I mean, um, yeah, I'm, I'm here to help, man. Yeah. You know, that's that's half the half the fun. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I am rooting 
for cool art. I'm always rooting for cool art, and I'm rooting for the people who make it. And any time that I can help uh, make it happen or, or uh, bring attention to it uh, is a good day for, for me. Um, and because I, I feel like, yeah, basically, um, I was a kid running uh, uh, down the, the strip and somebody handed me a torch. Uh, and now I get to fucking hand that on and be part of the uh, enormous, endless uh, baton race towards uh, keeping the human spirit alive. That's a great analogy. Um, and Through singing penises. And, and yeah, whatever it takes, baby. You know? um, so, Laura, there you are with the torch. I, I just want to say, um, but I, I want to say something about uh, Skip as a mentor, so okay. to speak. Um, because one of the things... Um, I think that's really important to know about Skip, which everybody who knows him knows this, but if you, you may not, is that his um, his love, attention, and absolute devotion to the human spirit, and meaning um, what is good, what is true, and what is joyous, is what makes him so unique and wonderful. And the thing that I look up to him the most for is that. Absolutely. One, one of the things he said to me, um, or he was actually saying it to someone else when I was in the room. He said uh, at a party one, t one time, he said, well, I, I thought about it and I was like, what is the one thing I want to be more than anything else in this world? And that that's happy. And I thought about it and I thought if I spend all the time if I put that as my goal, I, I think I'll be able to, if I put that as my goal and I put that much effort into it, I think I can reach that. If, if people put as much effort into um, cultivating their capacity for happiness um, as they put into their job or their career yeah. or their relationships or their favorite sports team or wherever else they put their energy, uh, they might get fairly good at it. Yeah. That, that was the thing that I concluded. Um, Actually, I heard Bjork say that, uh, and and just went exactly. Yeah. Thank you for reminding me why I want to be alive. Um, so yeah, you can thank Bjork a little bit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but but you live it. You really do, and you really are are quite devotional to it. Oh and, yeah, and I I agree. You embody that, man. Yeah. I mean, you you could be a cult leader. Oh man, you yeah. you really could. I, I would drink that Kool Aid. <laughs> Um, Le Leslie Sternberg's uh, husband Adam said to me, uh, "You know, you could have your own cult. I just don't think you'd like the people." That are <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, "Yeah, you know what? I think I'll pass on that shit." Oh man! Well, because they're just so um, bottomlessly corrupt. The minute you let yourself uh, be treated that way, right? Um, the opportunities for indulging your worst instincts and uh, and abusing the people around you are almost, uh, you know, they're too tempting. Uh, so many really, really well-intentioned people wound up being just degenerate fucksticks as a result of buying into that cult of personality thing. Right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the ability to, to relentlessly laugh at yourself uh, is a really great antidote to that sort of mindfuck mentality. And uh, so, yeah, I mean... I would like my own religion for the non-profit uh, uh, status, <laughs> but, uh, but I wouldn't actually want anyone to join it. Um, so, you know, that, that scheme totally wouldn't work out. Uh. <laughs> well, I, I, I think you deserve a, a round of applause. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And the audience is at home clapping, too. What, for not being a dick? <laughs> Thank you. For being you, man. For yeah. being fucking genuine. I, look. The three of us, all three of us, know just how many phony motherfuckers there oh. are in this industry. Oh, Jesus. You are not one of them. Thank you. You know? Yeah. And Laura, you are not one of them either. No, she is not. Now, we established why you were gone. Laura had not actually read you mm -hmm. before meeting you at that casting call. But I suspect you read a lot of Kurt Vonnegut yeah. early on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I see his influence on yeah. you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who else? Um, J.D. Salinger. Um, and 
I well, pretty much as a kid, I read everything I could get my hands on. I'm I always, always, always was reading. Yeah. So um, I went through a huge V.C. Andrews stage where I read all V.C. Andrews, um, which I would argue is horror. Of course, <laughs> oh, oh absolutely. I, I'm not sure about the the ghost written Andrew Niederman stuff, uh, yeah, but no. but her original yeah, stuff, the, yeah, Sweet Audrina and I, yeah, all that stuff. So I used to devour those books. Um, uh, Joyce Carol Oates, um, Dostoevsky, um, Edith Wharton, um, the, the the house of the book, the house of mirth. The first time I read that, I think I was a sophomore in high school, and um, I can remember just sobbing and sobbing and sobbing myself to sleep after reading it. It was yeah. just the most beautiful, sad, amazing book. So um, you were a voracious reader yeah. from an early age. Yeah. But you you started doing screenplays first, correct? Um, or were were you writing before that? I was always I pretty much I've written my whole life. Um, it was the first thing I actually wanted to be. Um, I would write poetry. I I wrote um, my first novel when I was like six or seven. Aww. The Foundling about a little puppy who was thrown <laughs> into the river and then had to find his way out and you know through various hijinks finally find. I would out. read the hell out of that. <laughs> Do you still where, have it? I don't know where it is, but yeah, oh, I was very serious about the Foundling. And people were like, oh no, no, no. I'm sorry. It was called the. It was called Foundler, and I remember telling my sister, she said, "Do you mean Foundling?" I said, "No, it's Foundler." No, it's Foundling. Yeah, Jesus. The name is Foundler, not Foundling. It's that's what Dungeon. That's what Dungeon Master seventy seven point one does to me. Uh, <laughs> do you mean this word? No, no, Dad. I know damn well what I mean. <laughs> Foundler sounds better. Um, uh, so you you wanted to be a writer, not a filmmaker. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I wanted to be a writer um, up until I think. Um, I think a freshman in high school and then I had this profound epiphany that I would never be as good as I wanted to be and that I would I would be better served just being a reader that was my um, I can remember reading Franny and Zoo for the first time and I and I read it and I thought you know what I I think I just want to I, I would never be able to to write like this, I would never be able to express ideas like this in this profound of a way, and I, uh, and I think I, I think I'm a pretty mediocre spirit. I think I'm a mediocre spirit. So I don't want to be. I, I would write all these quotes on my wall and marker, and I remember one of them was Albert Einstein's, which said, "Great spirits always encounter violent opposition from mediocre minds." And I said, "I don't ever want to be a person who provides." violent opposition to great spirits. I want to be somebody who supports great spirits. And so I kind of accepted my own mediocrity and I gave up the idea of being a writer and decided I wanted to be, well, I didn't know what. I wanted to get out of Portales, New Mexico. And right. um, so did whatever I could to do that, which was, you know, get straight A's by regurgitating, you know, the teacher's ideas. I can remember, and everything I would write that came from my heart was always uh, rejected violently by my teachers, right. <laughs> the teachers that I respected very much. So um, <laughs> wow. I learned to sort of uh, smile, nod, and give people back what they were giving me. Um, and all the while, um, it was this process of sort of uh, um, becoming less and less the person that I was mm. and more and more the person that I um, I thought was okay to be. Right. They um, wanted you to be. And that's why I got... And I've always been a performer from the time I was probably four years old. I was out there singing in front of huge audiences and things like that. So, right. um but that was about the same time where I really discovered what a great actor I was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, I mean, I could really, you know, I was, uh, I got all the great roles. I, you know, did really well in like competitions. And so I, I, and it, I realized that that's where I felt the most alive and myself is when I was pretending to be a character. Um, so I, I felt that that's what I. So you felt comfortable, you felt comfortable with acting but not yeah. with writing. Now, do you still struggle with that to this day? 
No, 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 no okay. not at all. No, <laughs> all <right. laughs> no. Because I do. You, Forty books later, I still think I'm a mediocre writer. Oh, I wouldn't mm. say I think that I'm a. I wouldn't say that I think I'm a great writer, but or something like that. I think that I am myself as a writer. Okay. I feel very much like I am me as a writer, and that. I, a lot of times I like to think I'm, I'm only as good as people tell me I am because whether I'm good or whether I'm bad isn't really, I feel like ultimately I work to, to make it as clean and shiny and good as I possibly can. Right. Yes. I, I really go back and I'm like, is that the right word? Is that the right thing? Does that express what I mean? So I, I really, really work hard to make it as as excellent as I can, but ultimately, um, what I'm doing is um, bringing my voice, and, yeah. and that's and that's what I feel like I can I can do well is bring my voice in both fields, really. If yeah. you think about it, yeah. I mean, look at uh, look at the Little Death. Um, now that that was a, a film. It premiered at Vision Fest in New York City. Um, you were the writer. Mm -hmm. You were the star, mm -hmm. and. You know, as it turns out, it won Best Writing. Uh, it also won Best Actress. So there's both of those things yeah, right there. Yeah, I love that. I, I love that movie so much. And um, that was a movie that I, I wrote in a very... Uh, it was right after... I was going through the festival circuit with Jesus Freak, and I had this idea as I was watching all the festivals. I was like, you know... Because Jesus Freak is a very, you know, weird, awkward movie. I was like, I want to write a movie that everybody likes <laughs> I know how to do that I know what to, I know what to do and so you know the little death is so you know every time I every time I watch it I just feel this kind of calm come over me I just I, I, I love that movie so much yeah it's great now you brought up Jesus freak now I know I know the answer to this but the listening audience does not um, so I, I'm gonna ask it um, and before I do what I want to do is I, I, I want to read the description. Mm -hmm. of Jesus Freak, okay? Life in Portales, New Mexico isn't easy for high school bad girl Lily. Lily. Weekends mean endless cruising until the cough syrup kicks in. <laughs> the boy she loves won't commit. She's surrounded by strident born-again Christians, and her budding sexuality is starting to earn her a reputation. To top it off, while others in her Sunday school class report visions of Jesus as Ronald Reagan or Leonardo DiCaprio, Lily's personal savior appears to her as a gangly Spanish-speaking migrant worker. How much of that is autobiographical? <laughs> That's my question. Um, it's funny because uh, I can remember... I, many, not many, but some years back, um, watching the Jesus Freak um, alone in my apartment, and it suddenly hit me that while most of the facts of that movie, the what happens in the plot, was completely fiction, the emotional core of it is 100% exactly what was happening. To me. Yeah. It is a snapshot of my emotional life at the time that we were filming it. Mm -hmm. So even though I had written it as, um, you know, this sort of high school uh, drama, which, you know, we shot later, um, it, it was a real picture of where I was emotionally at the time. And in that way, it is, it's probably the most vulnerable, um, definitely performance and, and, it, oh, yeah. When I see it now, I'm, I'm horrified. <laughs> like, oh my god, I feel like I'm just naked and the whole thing, and I'm like, oh, it's it's painful. Yeah. I'm yeah. that I'm that way with uh, Girl in the Glider and Dark Hollow yeah. and Ghoul to yeah. some extent. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, I put too much myself yeah. out there. You know, yeah. but you know, Variety loved it. Uh, they they said uh, in regards to your performance and that there's a Claire Danes quality to Barr's gentle, nuanced performance that solid, solidly anchors the film. Yeah. So, it's going to be good, right? Yeah. It, yeah. I'm really happy with how that movie did, and I'm, I'm really happy. I mean, that movie was a, a miracle in so many ways. And uh, when we filmed it, there was a crew of, I think, the, I think 30 of us, 60 of us. I don't know. We all went and lived in a former juvenile reintegration center down in Portales. Right. And it was just... You know, a bunch of people right out of college, um, or some still in college, 
making a movie. And you were from Portales, right? Yeah. I mean, originally you grew up in Utah, but then you moved to Portales. Yeah. So it was a homecoming in some yeah. Was the town, like, excited? Oh, my gosh, they're filming a movie here. It, it <laughs> just because you used the word homecoming, at one point um, uh, I looked over at who they'd gotten to stand in um, as a, a, a stand-in for the male uh, lead and I said, "Oh, that's my homecoming date." <laughs> he was teaching your homecoming date. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he was there. <laughs> he stood in. It was, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, we it was like the mean girl that you didn't get along with in high school. Was she there? <laughs> well, yeah, no, they weren't there. Yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, it was, it was, it was wonderful. The, the town made a big deal out of it, yeah, though. Like yeah. they shut the streets down. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Um, my friend Martin, who actually uh, was living there at the time and helped us make the movie, and then he moved out to L.A., he said to me well, after we filmed it and we were going back to L.A., he turned to me and goes, Laura, congratulations. You just did the coolest thing that has ever happened in Port Alton, Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that not a blurb on the, the cover of the DVD? <laughs> It is in Portales. <laughs> it is in Portales. Has the Bizarro community, I mean, obviously they're aware that you're a filmmaker and you're an actress, but do you ever get feedback from them on your movies, or is it is it more the books? Well, Boned. Yeah, Boned is... Uh, so Boned I didn't get to Boned yet, Skip. God damn We're it. still on the little death in Jesus Christ. Um, I don't think many... I don't think... Many bizarros are aware of uh, Jesus Freak of the Little Death. I don't know. Really? I think may maybe they are, but I think they're more. The more is about uh, haunt, and yeah. Well, right? they they will be after after, after this now. episode. After this episode, yeah. um, talk about Boned. Now that's finished. That's wrapped. It's out. It's distributed. Yeah. Um, where's it available? Amazon. Amazon, iTunes. There's there's like there's a probably. Close to thirty different platforms. It's all on the website at bonethemovie dot com. Yeah, remember. VOD all over the place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, would you classify it as bizarre? Yeah, <laughs> it's funny. It's, it's uh, definitely um, one of the producers was like, "This is bizarro." This is a bizarro. Let's call it a bizarro comedy. <laughs> After the fact, <laughs> this is totally bizarro. I think that that's just uh, everything I do. So. Sell it. Sell it to the listening audience. Why should they go rent it tonight when um, they're done listening to this? Well, so it is a unromantic comedy. It is. That's for you, Dave. That's for you. <laughs> unromantic. <laughs> but it's it's a lot of um, it's a lot of fun. It's um, it's dark. In a um, bizarre way, it's Holly weird. It's it's very it's very cheerful for considering how dark it is. Yeah, um, yeah. It, uh, but again, c can I sneak in for just a second? Uh, yeah, and, and just say one of the uh, amazing qualities that Laura brings to everything that she does um, is that you're laughing and you're having a great time, and then all of a sudden you're like, "But why am I crying?" Um, that was my experience with Jesus Freak. You know, it really fucking sneaks up on you, and and, and uh, because it has all these layers, uh, because you have all these layers, Laura Barr, um, and um, yeah, and just so much smarts and, and authentic soul in it. You know, you guys are all talking about how swell my soul is, but Laura Barr's soul is uh, way the fuck up there. I would you agree. You can't see my hand I would way agree. above my head. I would agree. It's as tall as Wrath James White right <laughs> now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, no. On a soul level? Absolutely. Yep. Put Laura Barr. It's like if you put Paul Tremblay on Wrath's shoulders. It's that high right now. <laughs> Big old soul. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, what what's remarkable about Bone for me uh, is just that it's a Hollywood film, um, it, it, it's a, a very sly play on noir um, in a 21st century uh, L.A. style, um, um, and it's just charming and funny, and she gets wonderful performances out of her actors because she really understands acting. Right. Um, um, and then these moments sneak up on you and just go, oh, holy shit. Um, and so it has like little depth charges of resonance that uh, uh, that most movies of most movies playing in any of the genres that she's playing in don't have, and this is something that applies also to her books. 
Um, what I treasure most in artists in many, many ways is surprise. Yeah. I, want, I want to be surprised, man. I, I don't want to know what's going to happen. And when it happens, I want to go, oh, fuck, I didn't see that coming. And it's not just because they've done some amazing plot twist, but it's because they saw the world in some sort of way that just uh, tilted it and canted it and uh, Dutch angled it um, where, um, yeah, where I'm not where I thought I was and uh, and am the better for it. Uh, Again... To me, art is about waking people up in so many ways. What what art is, as opposed to entertainment, uh, entertainment is about engaging and having fun. Art is about sneakily waking people up. And uh, this is why I, I strongly advocate for art attainment, um, which uh, uh, gets rid of all of the boring elements of art and all of the non-soul impacting elements of entertainment. I'm down for that. One of the, one of the kindest things anyone has ever said about me. And one of my dearest friends, Nick Mamatas, mm. uh, in, in an interview we did back and forth, accused me of making entertaining art. Yes. And, and I will wear that shit yeah. like a badge of honor. Yeah. As you well know? you should, yes. my friend. Yep. Yes. As well you should. Yes. Um, because because you, you are again, man. Yeah. Um, um, you're a real soul, dude. You, you're you're one of those guys. Of that course, the, yeah, the, the, 100%. the minute the minute that I I met you, it was like, okay, this dude is the real fucking deal. Totally. This this dude uh, is exactly who he says he is, trying to deliver exactly what he says he's trying to deliver. But my soul is blackened and dark. <laughs> <laughs> uh, dude, whose is it? You think you think mine is? not I am not a fucking saint, my friend. I am so far from a saint. It's absurd. It's, the cover blurb you gave me is still my favorite cover blurb of all time. It, it, have you ever seen it? It says, uh, "It says if Brian Keene's fiction were a song, it would occupy a hard-earned space on the shelf between Johnny Cash, Bruce Springsteen, and Eminem." Yeah. Fuck yeah. Yeah. Fuck yeah. yeah. And you know what? I I, I, I stand yes. I stand 100 yeah. percent by it. I remember the day you sent that to me. I I just walked around, called everybody, <laughs> called everybody I fucking knew. You, you gotta hear this. <laughs> <laughs> so Laura, okay. Now Boned was your first directing job, yeah. right? Yeah. What what did you, do you like directing? Do you got the bug now? Well, because you got to be in charge. Well, it it's. It's one of those things that I felt people had been telling me for a while that I should do it. And I was like, no, I never want to do it. No. And when um, I realized that if I wanted my stories to be the way I wanted them, I needed to direct them and get them out. Um, I was like, I have to do it. So the thing about directing is, you know, it's a, uh, it's, it's a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work. And it's the, it is the, you know, it's, it's, I think to be done, um, right requires, um, not just understanding what the vision is of the piece that you want to be, but understanding what you are getting and what you have and what you can do with that. So right. it's, it's a, it's, requires a lot of mental flexibility well it's, a a, it's also a collaborative process it is the, you know the, yeah it is 100 percent collaborative in fact it is in a way like you have no control <laughs> i mean you do you have all this control but you also have no control um and it is like a big high i mean definitely for boned and for jesus freak and for the little death none of those would exist without everybody who worked on them bringing so much generosity, so much talent, so much drive. On Boned especially, um, I will say, you know, Angela Landis, my producer and star, she is fucking amazing. Like, mm-hmm. what she does, who she is, mm-hmm. her talent, her drive, her ability, incredible, incredible. Um, Josh Rocky, my other producer, amazing. Kirk Roos, amazing. Um, our editor, uh, Joe Mikan, he from read the script... And he came in before we, we shot anything. He was a such a champion of this project. He worked tirelessly on this project. I, he It wouldn't exist without him. Um, our, so our actors, our talent, everybody just 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 gave so much of themselves. Our, our cinematographer, I could never have, I could have never made the movie look as, he, he brought 
all of the um, talent for understanding how to get it to look like that and how to do it in that time frame. Right, right. He knew how to get those shots off in the time that we had and make them look beautiful. And that's Royce, um, Royce Allen Dudley, or as I like to call him, Studley. <laughs> Royce Studley. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, it, fiction-wise, correct me if I'm wrong, you, you haven't done any collaborations, right? No. Well, mm-hmm. I, I, I mean, I've done a couple stories. Um, I wrote, uh, you know, I just wrote a story with Chris Kelso called The Invisible World. Um, I, I've, written, I've written some collaborations. I did a musical called Gothmas, which I wrote with Kareseth Lordigan. Which was amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, we wrote and started in that. It was a, that was a fun, fun musical. Um, it's about a, um, it's about a three-way um, between a, a gay guy, his best friend, who's a girl, and a bisexual guy, and they have like this, this threesome, and then um, the, the lover, Joe is his name, ends up um, killed with an axe on Christmas Eve, and the lovers suspect each other, and through the music try to figure out who really killed him. That doesn't sound like a fun Christmas Eve <laughs> at all. And Skip, you've obviously you've done a ton of collaborations. Well, yeah, including uh, a couple with Laura Barr. Really? They have not come out yet. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, this yeah. is an exclusive. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, we've done so many. In fact, uh, so Skip, I didn't even bring up, I didn't know if I should. Oh, so can, can, I'm going to bring up our first collaboration. Mm-hmm. Our very first collaboration that didn't happen was um, back when we had first become friends. We did a music video, mm-hmm. and then Skip was talking to me about this um, project he had been brought on to write, um, <laughs> 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 which was a porn movie based on The Idiot. <laughs> and I said, that is one of my favorite books. <laughs> And he said, I've never read it. And I said, well, I'll, I'll help you with that. I'll, 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 I'll write that with you. <laughs> so you gave him the Cliff Notes version of the idiot? Well, what I, ended up I, happening... I've never read it. <laughs> he bought it. He read it. Uh, well, I, I read enough of it. <laughs> <laughs> Was not a fan. Um, oh, it's so good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I, I, I totally get that Dostoevsky is a great writer. He is not a writer for me. Um, but okay, so then we wind up meeting this fucking guy. Um, this is this is so before before this meeting actually, yeah. because you know I, I I meet a lot of people. I work with people. I I love you know, and I I love collaborating. So I I just gotten to know Skip. We. we and, you know, I was like, okay, this is a weird gig for me, but I, I want to do it, and this seems like good. But I, I didn't know I didn't know if I could really trust him, right. if that makes sense. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah we didn't know each other that well. Yeah. yeah. So we, we go to this meeting at the Lamplighter. The Lamplighter. The Lamplighter, <laughs> um, which is a, a bar... Uh, just a couple of blocks from um, where Can B used to be located. Oh, okay. Those, those guys used to uh, go there a lot, but it was also a, a major hangout for for porn people um, because. Which explains why the guys from Can B were hanging out there. Well, because um, they they were they were nestled right into that same little chunk of uh, outer Los Angeles, one of the eight hundred and fifty seven thousand suburbs that define the greater Los Angeles area. Uh, where so much of, of porn was being made, and um, so it did not seem like an unnatural thing to go meet him there. Laura, you should tell this story because you're going to tell it very so, well. So you know, uh, I'd never really watched porn before. <laughs> I know that seems crazy, but it's true. I mean, I grew up a Mormon in Utah, so right. you know, it was uh, I'd seen some, but not really. So when Skip gave me Misty Beethoven, he's like, um, "Well, there's a lot of people fucking in it, just so you know." <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh yes, yes, there is a lot of great music too. Um, um, so yeah, but I'm like, uh-huh, okay, let's do this. I'm gonna write the the, the Dostoevsky part. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> I'll write the fucking part. Uh, I, got, I got I got that down. So um, so we go into this meeting and this guy, um, <laughs> this guy. I, I mean, he he just it was definitely a very strange human and he never took his sunglasses off i think he was probably coked out i don't know he, I he, think so. he, he was definitely on something was he like a porn producer yeah, yeah. He was a porn director and okay. he, he actually had like tons of visual flair uh he had an artistic sensibility and the fact that he wanted to make a porn film out of dostoevsky's the idiot uh definitely spoke to his ambition yeah um but he was also like batshit crazy yeah yeah seriously batshit crazy so as we're sitting there at the 
we're sitting there, you know, having this little pitch session where we're talking, and he kept saying a few things that were like the big, like, you know, red flags, big bells, how soon can we get out of here, things like, soon you guys are going to be paying me to write this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or, no, 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 it's got to be, the, 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 you know, so, yeah, that, 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 that. that. One of those guys so convinced of his own genius and so completely berserkly up his own ass that he actually believed the insane things he was saying, Wow! Um, but couldn't take his sunglasses off to look us in the eye as he said them, which tells you a lot about, you know, the, the game you're playing. Yeah. Do go on. Um, so it was, <laughs> it, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there like really uncomfortable the whole, I'm just, you know, sitting there feeling like, how am I going to tell Skip that I just can't do this? I'm going to have to get, you know, once you get out and be like, I really don't feel comfortable doing this. I'm sorry. I said I was going to do it. But, and so I'm going through this little thing in my, Head as I'm sitting there, going. Ah, how's it going? Ah. So finally, the meeting ends. He's like, well, "Yeah, okay, we'll talk." You know, blah blah blah. Right. Skip made sure to get twenty dollars out of him or whatever for the copy of the. For for the idiot. Yeah, he's he going was, to reimburse me for, for buying like, a copy. I, of I need that. Money. And he was very insistent. I was like, "Huh, that's weird." So uh, we get in the car and because um, we'd driven up there together, and we get in the car and Skip turns to me and goes. I feel like I have to just squeegee out all my insides right now. <laughs> I can fucking work with that guy. <laughs> and that was the moment I was like, I can trust John Skip. <laughs> that was the moment I was like, okay. <laughs> so, wow. There was no way I was going to go there, and there was no way I was going to let you go there with me. <laughs> wow. Is that the secret to a good collaborator, Skip, trust? Oh, of course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. No, that 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 is the ingredient is trust. I mean, um, any two bozos can sit in a room and throw ideas at each other and see what sticks. Um, but if you aren't like surfing a compatible frequency and if you don't trust each other and, and understand, um, what it is to open yourself up on a level where you're willing to dance, uh, and, um, and create openly and not guardedly. Um, if 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 you can't do those things, you can't fucking do it. Yeah, it's, it's just a recipe for disaster. But if you can do it and you find fun people to play with, um, then you play, and it's a beautiful thing. So um, yeah, I mean, your instinct should allow you to determine very very quickly whether this is a person you can collaborate with or not, and. Uh, <clears throat> My soul trust antennae are very keenly dialed and always up, and I just go, okay, I can work with this person. I can't work with this person. Uh, you cut a lot of nonsense out of the way when you when when you steer by that frequency. Right. So um, yeah, yeah, yeah. If it doesn't feel right, it ain't right. Yeah. Get right. The fuck out. And our, our next collaboration was a fantastic movie called Pang. <laughs> Oh, yes. Not actually a, a, an idea, a, a, a movie so much as a series of jokes. <laughs> right. Uh, we told each other over and over. Uh, yeah, it was really know. fun. We went, to, we went and had coffee and talked about our idea of paying. I, I remember there was one about uh, watching Meat Rot. That was one of our vignettes. Oh, yeah. No, it, it was going to be a, a film uh, made entirely out of non sequiturs. Yeah. So the, the, this, d definitely anticipating uh, the, the bizarro phenomenon that was to come um but what we realized um was that we were actually uh, uh stitches in the same blanket that we were yeah. woven from the same star fabric yeah that we are very much the same kind of souls and, and understood each other on a ridiculously deep level um and uh, that's why we've been sworn enemies ever since. <laughs> <laughs> we actually, I, I'm just going to list like some of the collaborations we have. Like, so mm -hmm. then we did the 4th of July one. Yes. Um, we did Chateau Crackhorn. Yes. We did uh, Chateau Crackhorn. I'm, I'm stunned. <laughs> we did Jake's Wake mm -hmm. as, a, as a movie before it was a book. Right. Um, Laura wrote the first draft of, of Jake's Wake. Um, really? We, we sat down and we vamped out the characters together, and then she wrote a first draft, and I went, you don't know horror movies very well, <laughs> but you sure understand people. Um, so I took the character stuff and then 
massively rewrote the thing and then Cody jumped in, which is why the screenplay credit for Jake's Wake is uh, by John Skip, Laura Lee Barr, and Cody Goodfellow right. in that order. Um, and uh, so much of what she wrote wound up being part of the novel that eventually resulted from it. Right. Um, um, so, the, yeah, so we bounced on that. The 4th of July thing was very, very interesting. It was just basically uh, an idea I had for, uh, uh, and this was how many years ago? I don't know. Uh, you know like, it was uh, last year. Yeah, no, at, at least a decade like a, ago. Uh, like a, and, and it was basically it was basically about a Fourth of July party um, in an America so completely divided that uh, in the course of discussing politics, in the course of the Fourth of July barbecue, uh, uh, everybody winds up killing each other. So it was basically now, yeah, America exactly. 2016. Exactly, yeah. it pretty much yeah. is right yeah. now. This exact wow. moment. Wow. Um, all right. So when are we going to see all these collected? I, I demand it. God damn it! Oh well, I mean, we I mean, you're gonna have to write them first. But we haven't mentioned the thing, the two things we're actually working on now. Um, well, you know what? Let's let's end the show on that note. Give me some exclusives. Okay, so Laura Barr and I have um, possibly one motion picture and one uh, TV series that we are developing together. TV series is definitely a way to go in Hollywood right now. There's a lot more money there than there is in film. Right. And uh, you, you can go expansive on them. I can't tell you what they are because that would be stupid. But I can tell you, <laughs> I can tell you that um, one of them is very, very much involved with uh, um, Internet outrage culture and what happens when uh, one comedian tells the wrong joke and the whole, whole world turns against them. Oh my god, I would watch the shit out of that. Dude, uh, if, if you know the story that we want to tell, yeah, you would. Yeah. Um, uh, the other one... Uh, Wait, does he make a joke about the HWA and then like the whole <laughs> internet turns on him? <laughs> That's it's called the Brian King story. <laughs> That's all we can talk. Uh, <laughs> I'm not even going to tell you if it's a he. <laughs> Somebody's head gets cut in with a trophy. It's a oh, man. <laughs> so it's blood dripping down. But the other one is basically the female Freddy Krueger we've all been waiting for. Nice. And um, and I'm really really excited about it. And uh, I, I think it's not a movie. I think it's a, a, a TV series. And I, I think we're gonna write the living shit out of it. And um, yeah, again, I mean, if if we're closing up, the thing that I want to communicate to everybody is that yeah, I'm not writing novels right now. I'm a filmmaker right now. Okay. I'm a filmmaker right now. That's what I'm focused on. I'm focused on making movies. I'm going to shoot a movie this uh, winter over Christmas break. First feature with Andrew Cash, who I direct with, the guy who did Never Sleep Again. Right. We've been working together ever since. Um, um, did Tales of Halloween, did Monsterland, have all these projects. Uh, both television and, and film going out to do. Um, I'm loving writing short fiction right now. I'm loving editing books right now with Fungasm Press and, and having incredible writers to work with who I feel are doing what needs to be done with books while I'm not going to be doing it right now. Right. Um, um, and love all those writers. Uh, one of them is actually at our table uh, tonight. Um, um, but... Well, yeah, you're bringing out her new short story collection. Can we talk correct. about that? Yeah, as soon as I finish this. Okay, book. all right. Um, I just want people to understand that I, I haven't abandoned the the field or I haven't abandoned, abandoned um, uh, making art. I am working constantly. I write every single fucking night to make the movies that let me put it to you this way, man. If I don't have at least three feature films out, um, 
that leave a mark on the culture at least as large as the light at the end or anything that I've ever done. Yeah. Before I die, I'm gonna be really fucking pissed off, and um, I'm determined to not go to my grave that kind of pissed off. Obviously, I'm never gonna get to do everything I want to do because nobody ever does. But um, I'm a filmmaker, dude. That, that's what I am right now. I, I have written maybe every novel I will ever write, and if I write another one, it will because it will be because uh, something comes up and it's just like. I got to write this thing, which is what happened with conscience. Yeah. Conscience was a script that wouldn't happen. It just wouldn't come and wouldn't come. I had this story. I knew it was great. Wouldn't come, wouldn't come. Went to dark delicacies one day and I'm looking at the books, all the books that have come out since I stopped writing books. And I went, you know, it might be fun to write one of those one day again. And I went home and I wrote the first chapter. And then I sat down every night until I'd written conscience. So art is like that sometimes. It's just like it tells you you need to do this thing now. But I'm I'm a filmmaker. That, that's that's what I want to do. I, I spend all day thinking about the shots I want to get, um, who I need to bring in, how we're going to pull it, how we're going to get the fucking money, assembling teams, and just going, okay, this is going to happen. And... Um, Yeah, I, I, I couldn't I couldn't go off the air without saying that because because that's the fucking truth. I think that's fair enough, man. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I hope every, again. I hope everybody's not mad at me. Uh, I don't think anyone's going to be mad at you because you know, like we said, what, whether whether you like the term or not, you're you are the elder statesman. Um, and Laura, I think you would agree with me. I there's no doubt in my mind that you will find that success with filmmaking, the same as you, as you found with pros i mean it's gonna happen you know i am as good a filmmaker as i am a writer that that's the thing absolutely you know and, and it's like all the same discipline all the same devotion anything i ever brought to that i bring into this other thing so if i can pull it off uh, obviously you know directing is harder than writing in in the sense that First, you have to write it, so you're already doing the writing thing, and then you have to get everybody to enact it. Right. And it's just... It's very demanding, and it's gobbled me. And uh, as a, a man pre-gobbled, I have no choice but to uh, continue on this path, <laughs> which, incidentally, I fucking chose. So uh, A man I, pre-gobbled. The John Skip story. The John Skip story. <laughs> With my friend Cody Goodfellow, who <laughs> dissolves all the genres before him, uh, <laughs> with whom I'm also writing all this crazy stuff, including the shit that Andrew and I are going to shoot this uh, this winter. Yeah. Which I also can't tell you about, except for that it is also about rage culture, and uh, particularly about um, the anti-feminist backlash uh, and what happens when a woman goes, you know, fuck this. I'm shooting back. Right. You mean like the whole Gamergate thing? Yes. And, okay. Yes. All right. Um, so, so yeah, I'm, I am like in a, a really kind of intensely political mode right now. Um, um, so you're still splatterpunk. Oh, I'm splatterpunk as fuck. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Wait, no, I've changed my mind. Splatterpunk as fuck. That's fuck. <laughs> the John Skip story. <laughs> yeah, man. All right, Laura. Yeah. New short story collection. Yeah. Yes. I just found out about it tonight. Now the listening audience is going to find out about it. Tell us about that before we go. Here. Um, yeah, it's basically... Um, it's, it's a collection of a lot of the work that has been in some anthologies and some new stuff. Um, there's a couple stories in particular that have been in uh, a few anthologies that I'm so... Um, proud of and uh, I really want to shine some light on them um, and there's so they're featured in this anthology there's going to be um, some new stuff in there it's a uh, it's 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 something that's very different for me in that a lot of the short stories that I have move through many different genres um, so there's some science fiction in there there's some um, uh, straight horror in there there's some just kind of literary coming of age stuff in there um 
but what puts them all together is their pieces of me. So the, the collection is called Angel Meat, and it is... Which, incidentally, is what she's made of. <laughs> it is uh, definitely... Um, it is definitely pieces of my heart and soul. And, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm really excited to share them, and I'm super happy that uh, Skip wants to publish them, and... Um, yeah, and, and thank you for handing me the manuscript today so that I can actually read all of these things. I, I witnessed it. I, I witnessed her handing it to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and thank you both for this. This oh, has dude. just been, this has been fucking delightful. Yeah, oh, yeah. Man, it's it's so, really so has. This, this has been great. <laughs> what know. a nice way to spend an evening. It is. Seriously, it is. Man. This is awesome. Cool. And now we're going to turn off these microphones and really talk about how we feel. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I listening audience. I'm kidding. You you won't find two more genuine people in these business than the than the two folks we just had on. And, you know, and everything they said is is the god honest truth or the Cthulhu honest truth or whatever deity you worship. So, all right, well, guys, thank you very much. Thank you. And, and my my uh, balcony in uh, Eagle Rock, California, uh, was proud to host you. Uh, all of the coastline says good night. Uh, good night. Good, good night, coastline. And, and yeah, I, f- holy fuck, I'm sitting on John Skip's balcony here. <laughs> How awesome is that? Tell me my life ain't working out. All right, Dave, back to you. And we're back. I uh, hope you enjoyed that interview. Um, it's pretty awesome. Yeah. I don't know what interview we're going to run next week because we have a couple in the can. I'm not sure yet which one we're going to do. I know you have some great interviews coming up. Yeah, there's uh, there's one with Nick Mamatas. There's one with Gene O'Neill. We're planning to record some of Scares It Cares. Obviously, that's this week. I'm not going to say any names because I'm not sure. You never know who you can get because of scheduling and stuff. So I'm not sure who exactly we'll end up with. But we'll announce that in the future. I'm sure it'll be wonderful. You've got uh, some really great interviews yeah, in the past at Scares It Cares. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so that's pretty much the show for the week. Like I said, it wasn't a whole lot of us talking. It was mostly an interview, which most people are like, yeah, that, that's good. Do that more often. Well, um, sorry for rambling. That's yeah. just me. Well, no, that's, it's fine. Um, again, again, next week, I'm not sure what we're going to do, but you know, it'll be the usual nonsense. It'll be an interview and it may just be me again and, and me and Phoebe or something else. I, I don't know Brian's schedule to be honest with you. So, but we'll see what happens. Um, so you have anything else to, to add to the proceedings here before we, we sign off for the day? No. Okay. (laughs) Not really. Okay. Well, there you go. So uh, remember you can always listen to the horror show on uh, iTunes, Roku, Stitcher, all uh, Google Music Play, all the other places, and of course you can find it at projectiradio.com. If there's something you want to hear us talk about, if you got some comments about the show, you can always uh, contact us on Twitter or send an email to the horror show or our Facebook page, which is getting closer to the thousand like mark. So Yay! if you haven't liked it, please uh, please go to like our Facebook page. Please and do. Uh, again, if you want to run ads on the show, feel free to send us an email to horror show. And uh, we'll, I'll get back to you about the uh, rates. And I have mentioned in the past, uh, I do want to keep mentioning this, that rates are going to go up as of September 1st of this year. However, if you buy any ads between now and then, for any point of the rest of the year, they'll be at the old rate. So if you're thinking of buying an ad, now is the time to do it. So uh, you definitely want to do that. Um, so that's it for me. I'm Dave. I'm Phoebe. And uh, we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.